horror at the poles, five numbing nightmares in the remote, bleak and ominous wastes of Earth's polar regions. Ghost by Henry Cutner The President of Integration almost fell out of his chair. His ruddy cheeks turned sallow, his jaw dropped, and the hard blue eyes behind their flexo lenses lost their look of keen inquiry and became merely stupefied. Ben Halliday slowly swiveled around and stared out at the skyscrapers of New York as though to assure himself that he was living in the twenty-first century and the golden age of science. No witches riding on broomsticks were visible outside the window. Only slightly reassured, Halliday turned back to the prim, grey, tight-mouthed figure across the desk. Dr. Elton Ford did not look like Cagliostro. He resembled what he was, the greatest living psychologist. "'What did you say?' Halliday asked weakly. Ford put his fingertips together precisely, and nodded. You heard me. The answer is ghosts. Your Antarctic integration station is haunted. You're joking. Halliday sounded hopeful. I'm giving you my theory in the simplest possible terms. Naturally, I can't verify it without field work. Ghosts! The trace of a smile showed on Ford's thin lips, without sheets or clanking chains. This is a singularly logical sort of ghost, Mr. Halliday. It has nothing to do with superstition. It could have existed only in this scientific age. In the castle of Otranto, it would have been absurd. Today, with your integrators, you have paved the way for hauntings. I suspect that this is the first of many, unless you take certain precautions. I believe I can solve this problem, and future ones, but the only possible method is an empirical one. I must lay the ghost, not with bell, book, and candle, but through application of psychology. Halliday was still dazed. You believe in ghosts? Since yesterday, I believe in a certain peculiar type of haunting. Basically, this business has nothing in common with the apparitions of folklore— but, as a result of new factors, the equation equals exactly the same as, well, the hauler, Blackwood's yarns, or even Bulwer Lytton's haunters and the haunted. The manifestations are the same. I don't get it. In witchcraft days, a hag stirred herbs in a cauldron, added a few toads and bats, and cured someone of heart disease. Today we leave out the fauna and use digitalis. Halliday shook his head in a baffled way. Dr. Ford, I don't quite know what to say. You must know what you're talking about. I assure you that I do. But listen, Ford said carefully. Since Bronson died, you can't keep an operator at your Antarctic station. This man, Larry Crockett, has even stayed longer than most, but he feels the phenomena too. A dull, hopeless desperation, completely passive and overpowering. But that station is one of the science centers of the world. Ghosts in that place? It's a new sort of ghost, Ford said. It also happens to be one of the oldest. Dangerous, too. Modern science, my dear man, has finally gone full circle and created a haunting. Now, I'm going down to Antarctica and try exorcism. Oh, Lord, Halliday said. The station's raison d'etre was the huge underground chamber known irreverently as the Brain Pan. It was something out of classic history, Karnak or Babylon or Ur, high-ceilinged and completely bare, except for the double row of giant pillars that flanked the walls. These were of white plastic and insulated, and each was twenty feet high, six feet in diameter, and featureless. They contain the new radioatom brains perfected by integration. They were the integrators. Not colloids, they consisted of mind machines, 
units reacting at light velocity speeds. They were not, strictly speaking, robots, nor were they free brains capable of ego consciousness. Scientists had broken down the factors that make up the intelligent brain, created supercharged equivalents, and achieved delicate, well-functioning organisms with a fantastically high IQ. They could be operated either singly or in circuit. The capability increased proportionately. The integrator's chief function was that of efficiency. They could answer questions. They could solve complicated problems. They could compute a meteorite's orbit within minutes or seconds, where a trained astrophysicist would have taken weeks to get the same answer. In the swift, well-oiled world of 2030, time was invaluable. In five years, the integrators had also proved themselves invaluable. They were superbrains, but limited. They were incapable of self-adjustment, for they were without ego. Thirty white pillars towered in the brain pan, their radioatom brains functioning with alarming efficiency. They never made a mistake. They were minds, and they were delicate, sensitive, powerful. Larry Crockett was a big, red-faced Irishman with blue-black hair and a fiery temper. Seated at dinner across from Dr. Ford, he watched dessert come out of the automat slot and didn't care a great deal. The psychologist's keen eyes were watchful. "'Did you hear me, Mr. Crockett?' "'What? Oh, yeah. But there's nothing wrong. I, I just feel lousy. Since Bronson's death, there have been six men at this post.' They have all felt lousy. Well, living here alone, cooped up under the ice. They had lived alone before at other stations. So had you. Crockett's shrug was infinitely weary. I don't know. Maybe I should quit, too. You're afraid to stay here? No, there's nothing to be afraid of. Not even ghosts, Ford said. Ghosts? A few of those might pep up the atmosphere. Before you were stationed here, you were ambitious. You planned on marrying. You were working for a promotion. Yeah. What's the matter? Lost interest? You might call it that, Crockett acknowledged. I don't see much point in... in anything. Yet you're healthy. The tests I gave you show that. There's a black, profound depression in this place. I feel it myself. Ford paused. The dull weariness lurking at the back of his mind crept slowly forward like a gelid, languid tide. He stared around. The station was bright, modern, and cheerful. Yet it did not seem so. He went on. I've been studying the integrators and find them most interesting. Crockett didn't answer. He was looking absently at his coffee. Most interesting. Ford repeated. By the way, do you know what happened to Bronson? Sure. He went crazy and killed himself. Here. Right. What about it? His ghost remains, Ford said. Crockett looked up. He pushed back his chair, hesitating between a laugh and blank astonishment. Finally, he decided on the laugh. It didn't sound very amused. Then Bronson wasn't the only crazy one, he remarked. Ford grinned. Let's go down and uh, see the integrators. Crockett met the psychologist's eyes, a faint, worried frown appearing on his face. He tapped his fingers nervously on the table. Down there? Why? Do you mind? Hell no, Crockett said after a pause. It, it's just the influence is stronger there. Ford suggested. You feel more depressed when you're near the integrators. Am I right? Okay, Crockett muttered. So what? The trouble comes from there. Obviously. They're running all right. We feed in the questions and we get the right answers. I'm not talking about intellect, Ford pointed out. I'm discussing emotions. Crockett laughed shortly. Those damn machines haven't got any emotions— none of their own. They can't create. All their potentialities were built into them. But listen, Crockett, you take a super-complicated thinking machine, a 
radio atom brain, and it's necessarily very sensitive and receptive. It's got to be. That's why you can have a thirty-unit hookup here. You're at the balancing point of the magnetic currents. Well, bring a magnet near a compass, and what happens? The compass works on magnetism. The integrators work on something else. And they're delicately balanced, beautifully poised. Are you trying to tell me they've gone mad? Crockett demanded. That's too simple, Ford told him. Madness implies flux. There are variable periods. The brains in the integrators are, well, poised, frozen within their fixed limits, irrevocably in their orbits. But they are sensitive to one thing, because they have to be. Their strength is their weakness. So, did you ever live with a lunatic? Ford asked. I'm sure you didn't. There's a certain effect on sensitive people. The integrators are a damn sight more mentally suggestible than a human being. You're talking about induced madness, Crockett said, and Ford nodded in a pleased fashion. An induced phase of madness, rather. The integrators can't follow the madness pattern. They're not capable of it. They're simply radioatom brains, but they're receptive. Take a blank phonograph record and play a tune. Cut the wax and you'll have a disc that will repeat the same thing over and over. Certain parts of the integrators were like blank records. Intangible parts that were the corollary of a finely tuned thinking apparatus. No free will is involved. The abnormally sensitive integrators recorded a mental pattern and are reproducing Bronson's pattern. So, Crockett said, the machines have gone nuts. No, lunacy implies consciousness of self. The integrators record and repeat, which is why six operators had to leave the station. Well, Crockett said, so am I, before I go crazy too. It's rather nasty. What's it like? I'd kill myself if it weren't too much trouble, the Irishman said succinctly. Ford took out a Salaflex notebook and spun the wheel. I have a case history of Bronson here. Do you know anything about types of insanity? Not much. Bronson, I used to know him. Sometimes he'd be way down in the dumps, and then again he'd be the life of the party. Did he ever mention suicide? Not that I know of. Ford nodded. If he'd talked about it, he never would have done it. He was that type. A manic depressive, moods of deep depression alternating with periods of elation. Early in the history of psychiatry, patients were classed in two groups, paranoia or dementia precox. But that didn't work. There was no line of demarcation. The types overlapped. Nowadays, we have manic depressive and schizophrenic. Schizoids can't be cured. The other can. You, Mr. Crockett, are a manic depressive type, easily influenced. Yeah? That doesn't mean I'm crazy, though. Ford grinned. Scarcely. Like everyone else, you trend in a certain direction. If you ever became insane, you would be a manic depressive, while I would be a schizophrenic, for I'm a schizoid type. Some psychologists are. It's the outgrowth of a compensated complex, socially channeled. You mean? The doctor went on. He had a purpose in explaining these matters to Crockett. Complete understanding is part of the therapy. Put it this way. Manic depressives are fairly simple cases. They swing from elation to depression, a big swing, unlike the steady quick pulse of a schizoid graph. It covers days, weeks, or months. When a manic depressive type goes over the border, his worst period is on the descending curve, the downbeat. He sits and does nothing. He's the most acutely miserable person on earth, sometimes so unhappy he even enjoys it. Not till the upcurve is reached does he change from passive to active. That's when he breaks chairs and requires a straitjacket. Crockett was interested now. He was applying Ford's words to himself, which was the normal reaction. The schizoid, on the other hand, Ford continued, has no such simple prognosis. 
Anything can happen. You get the split personality, the mother fixations, and the complexes. Oedipus, return to childhood, persecution, the king complex, an infinite variety almost. A schizoid is incurable, but luckily a manic depressive isn't. Our ghost here is manic depressive. The Irishman had lost some of his ruddy colour. I'm beginning to get the idea. Ford nodded. Bronson went insane here. The integrators were profoundly receptive. He killed himself on the downbeat of his manic depressive curve. That period of intolerable depression, and the mental explosion, the sheer concentration of Bronson's madness, impressed itself on the radioatom brains of the integrators. The phonograph record, remember? The electrical impulses from those brains keep sending out that pattern, the downbeat. And the integrators are so powerful that anyone in the station can't help receiving the impressions. Crockett gulped and drank cold coffee. My God, that's horrible. It's a ghost, Ford said. A perfectly logical ghost. The inevitable result of supersensitive thinking mechanisms. And you can't use occupational therapy on an integrator. Cigarette? Hmm. Crockett puffed smoke and scowled. You've convinced me of one thing, Doctor. I'm going to get out of here. Ford patted the air. If my theory is correct, there's a possible cure by induction. Eh? Bronson could have been cured if he'd had treatment in time. There are therapies. Now, Ford touched his notebook. I have built up a complete picture of Bronson's psychology. I have also located a manic depressive who is almost a duplicate of Bronson. A very similar case history, background, and character. A sick magnet can be cured by demagnetization. Meanwhile, Crockett said with a relapse into morbidity, we have a ghost. Nevertheless, he became interested in Ford's curious theories and the man's therapies. This calm acceptance of superstitious legend and proof had a fascination for the big Irishman. In Crockett's blood ran the heritage of his Celtic forebears, a mysticism tempered with a hardened toughness. He had lately found the station's atmosphere almost unendurable. Now... The station was a self-contained unit, so that only one operator was necessary. The integrators themselves were like sealed lubrication joints. Once built, they were perfect of their type, and required no repairs. Apparently nothing could go wrong with them, except, of course, induced psychic crack-up, and even that did not affect their efficiency. The integrators continued to solve abstruse problems, and the answers were always right. A human brain would have gone completely haywire, but the radio atom brain simply fixed their manic depressive downbeat pattern and continued to broadcast it, distressingly. There were shadows in the station. After a few days, Dr. Ford noticed those intangible, weary shadows that, vampiric, drew the life and the energy from everything. The sphere of influence extended beyond the station itself. Occasionally, Crockett went topside and muffled in his heat unit parker, went off on dangerous hikes. He drove himself to the limits of exhaustion, as though hoping to outpace the monstrous depression that crouched under the ice. But the shadows darkened invisibly. The grey, leaden sky of the Antarctic had never depressed Crockett before. The distant mountains, gigantic ranges towering like Emir's mythical brood, had not seemed sentient till now. They were half alive, too old, too tired to move, dully satisfied to remain stagnantly crouching on the everlasting horizon of the ice fields. As the glaciers ground down, leaden, powerful, infinitely weary, the tide of the downbeat thrust against Crockett. His healthy animal mind shrank back, failed, and was engulfed. He fought against it, but the secret foe came by stealth, 
and no wall could keep it out. It permeated him as by osmosis. It was treacherous and deadly. Bronson, squatting in silence, his eyes fixed on nothing, sunk into a black pit that would prison him for eternity. Crockett pictured that, and shuddered. Too often these days his thoughts went back to illogical tales he had read. M. R. James and his predecessor Henry James, Beers and Mason Clare, and others who had written of impossible ghosts. Previously, Crockett had been able to enjoy ghost stories, getting a vicarious kick out of them, letting himself for the moment pretend to believe in the incredible. Can such things be? Yes, he had said, but he had not believed. Now there was a ghost in the station, and Ford's logical theories could not battle Crockett's age-old superstition instinct. Since hairy men crouched in caves, there has been fear of the dark. The fanged carnivores roaring outside in the night have not always been beasts. Psychology has changed them. The distorted, terrible sound spawned in a place of peril. The lonely, menacing night beyond the firelight circle have created trolls and werewolves, vampires and giants, and women with hollow backs. Yes, there is fear. But most of all, beating down active terror, came the passive, shrouding cloak of infinitely horrible depression. The Irishman was no coward. Since Ford's arrival, he had decided to stay, at least until the psychologist's experiment had succeeded or failed. Nevertheless, he was scarcely pleased by Ford's guest, the manic depressive the doctor had mentioned. William Quayle looked not at all like Bronson, but the longer he stayed, the more he reminded Crockett of the other men. Quayle was a thin, dark, intense-eyed man of about thirty, subject to fits of violent rage when anything displeased him. His cycle had a range of approximately one week. In that time, he would swing from blackest depression to wild exultation. The pattern never varied, nor did he seem affected by the ghost. Ford said that the intensity of the upcurve was so strong that it blocked the effect of the integrator's downbeat radiation. I have his history, Ford said. He could have been cured easily at the sanitarium where I found him, but luckily I got my requisition in first. See how interested he's getting in plastics? They were in the brain pan. Crockett was unwillingly giving the integrators a routine inspection. Did he ever work in plastics before, Doc? The Irishman asked. He felt like talking. Silence only intensified the atmosphere that was murkiest here. No, but he's dexterous. The work occupies his mind as well as his hands. It ties in with his psychology. It's been three weeks, hasn't it? And Quail's well on the road to sanity. It's done nothing for... For this, Crockett waved toward the white towers. I know. Not yet, but wait a while. When Coyle's completely cured, I think the integrators will absorb the effect of his therapy. Induction, the only possible treatment for a radioatom brain. Too bad Bronson was alone here for so long. He could have been cured, if only. But Crockett didn't like to think about that. How about Quail's dreams? Ford chuckled. Hocus pocus, eh? But in this case, it's justified. Quail is troubled, or he wouldn't have gone mad. His troubles show up in dreams, distorted by the sensor band. I have to translate them, figuring out the symbolism by what I know of Quail himself. His word association tests give me quite a lot of help. How? He's been a misfit. It stemmed from his early relationships— he hated and feared his father, who was a tyrant. Quail, as a child, was made to feel he could never compete with anyone. He'd be sure to fail. He identifies his father with all his obstacles. Crockett nodded, idly watching a vernier. You want to destroy his feeling toward his father, is that it? The idea, rather, that his father has power. I must prove Quail's capabilities to himself— and also alter his attitude that his father was infallible. 
Religious mania is tied in, too, perhaps naturally, but that's a minor factor. Ghosts, Crockett said suddenly. He was staring at the nearest integrator. In the cold clarity of the fluorescence, Ford followed the other man's gaze. He pursed his lips, turning to peer down the length of the great underground room, where the silent pillars stood huge and impassive. I know, Ford said. Don't think I don't feel it too. But I'm fighting the thing, Crockett. That's the difference. If I simply sat in a corner and absorbed that downbeat, it would get me. I keep active, personifying the downbeat as an antagonist. The hard, tight face seemed to sharpen. It's the best way. How much longer? We're approaching the end. When Coyle's cured, we'll know definitely. Bronson, crouching in shadows, sunk in apathetic, hopeless dejection, submerged in a blind, blank horror so overwhelming that thought was an intolerable and useless effort, the will to fight gone, leaving only fear and acceptance of the stifling, encroaching dark. This was Bronson's legacy. Yes, Crockett thought, ghosts existed. Now, in the twenty-first century, perhaps never until now. Previously, ghosts had been superstition. Here, in the station under the ice, shadows hung where there were no shadows. Crockett's mind was assaulted continuously, sleeping or waking, by that fantastic haunting. His dreams were characterized by a formless, vast, unspeakable darkness that moved on him inexorably while he tried to run on leaden feet. But Quail grew better. Three weeks, four, five, and finally six passed. Crockett was haggard and miserable, feeling that this would be his prison till he died, that he could never leave it. But he stuck it out with dogged persistence. Ford maintained his integrity. He grew tighter, drier, more restrained. Not by word or act did he admit the potency of the psychic invasion. But the integrators acquired personalities for Crockett. They were demoniac, sullen, inhuman afrites crouching in the brain pan, utterly heedless of the humans who tended them. A blizzard whipped the ice cap to turmoil. Deprived of his trip's topside, Crockett became more moody than ever. The automats fully stopped provided meals, or the three would have gone hungry. Crockett was too listless to do more than his routine duties, and Ford began to cast watchful glances in his direction. The tension did not slacken. Had there been a change, even the slightest variation in the deadly monotony of the downbeat, there might have been hope, but the record was frozen forever in that single phase. Too hopeless and damned even for suicide, Crockett tried to keep a grip on his rocking sanity. He clung to one thought. Presently, Quail would be cured, and the ghost would be laid. Slowly, imperceptibly, the therapy succeeded. Dr. Ford, never sparing himself, tended Quail with gentle care, guiding him towards sanity, providing himself as a crutch on which the sick man could lean. Quail leaned heavily, but the result was satisfying. The integrators continued to pour out their downbeat pattern, but with a difference now. Crockett noticed it first. He took Ford down to the brain pan and asked the doctor for his reactions. Reactions? Why? Do you think there's... Just... Feel it, Crockett said, his eyes bright. There's a difference. Don't you get it? Yeah, Ford said slowly, after a long pause. I think so. It's hard to be sure. Not if both of us feel the same thing. That's true. There's a slackening, a cessation. Hmm, what did you do today, Crockett? Eh? Why, the usual. Oh, I picked up that Aldous Huxley book again which you haven't touched for weeks. It's a good sign. The power of the downbeat is slackening. 
It won't go on to an ascending curve, of course. It'll just die out. Therapy by induction. When I cured Quail, I automatically cured the integrators. Ford took a long, deep breath. Exhaustion seemed to settle down on him abruptly. "'You've done it, Doc,' Crockett said, something like hero worship in his eyes. But Ford wasn't listening. "'I'm tired,' he muttered. "'Oh, my God! I'm tired! The tension's been terrific, fighting that damned ghost every moment. I haven't dared allow myself a sedative, even. Well, I'm going to break out the amatol now.' "'What about a drink? We ought to celebrate, if—' Crockett looked doubtfully at the nearest integrator. "'If you're sure. There's little doubt about it. No. I want to sleep, that's all.' He took the lift and was drawn up out of sight. Left alone in the brain pan, Crockett managed a lopsided grin. There were still shadows lurking in the distance, but they were fading— He called the integrators an unprintable name. They remained imperturbable. Oh, sure, Crockett said. You're just machines. Too damn sensitive, that's all. Ghosts. Well, from now on, I'm the boss. I'm going to invite my friends up here and have one drunken party from sunrise to sunset. And the sun doesn't set for a long time in these latitudes. On that cogent thought, he followed Ford. The psychologist was already asleep, breathing steadily, his face relaxed in tired lines. He looked older, Crockett thought. But who wouldn't? The pulse was lessening. The downbeat was fading. He could almost detect the ebb. That unreasoning depression was no longer all-powerful. He was, yeah, beginning to make plans. I'm going to make chili, Crockett decided. The way that guy in El Paso showed me, and wash it down with scotch. Even if I have to celebrate by myself, this calls for an orgy. He thought doubtfully of Quail and looked in on the man, but Quail was glancing over a late novel and waved casually at his guest. Hi, Crockett. Anything new? No, no. I just feel good. So do I. Ford says I'm cured. <laughs> the man's a wonder. He is. Crockett agreed heartily. Anything you want? Nothing I can't get for myself. Quail nodded toward the wall automat slot. I'm due to be released in a few days. You've treated me like a brother Christian, but I'll be glad to get back home. There's a job waiting for me, one I can fill without trouble. Good. Wish I were going with you, but I have a two-year stretch up here, unless I quit or finagle a transfer. You've got all the comforts of home. Yeah, Crockett said, shuddering slightly. He hurried off to prepare chili, fortifying himself with smoky-tasting, smooth whiskey. If only he wasn't jumping the gun. Suppose the downbeat hadn't been eliminated. Suppose that intolerable depression came back in all its force. Crockett drank more whiskey. It helped, which in itself was cheering. Liquor intensifies the mood. Crockett had not dared touch it during the downbeat, but now he just got happier and finished his chili with an outburst of tuneless song. There was no way of checking the psychic emanation of the integrators with any instrument, of course. Yet the cessation of that deadly atmosphere had unmistakable significance. The radioatom brains were cured. Bronson's mental explosion with its disastrous effects— had finally run its course and been eliminated by induction. Three days later, a plane picked up Quail and flew back northward towards South America, leaving Ford to clean up final details and make a last checkup. The atmosphere of the station had changed utterly. It was bright, cheerful, functional. The integrators no longer sat like monstrous devil gods in a private hell. They were sleek, efficient tubes as pleasing to the eye as a brancusi, containing radioatom brains that faithfully answered the questions Crockett fed them. The station ran smoothly. Up above, the grey sky blasted a cleansing, icy gale upon the polar cap. 
Crockett prepared for the winter. He had his books. He dug up his sketch pad and examined his watercolors, and felt he could last till spring without trouble. There was nothing depressing about the station, per se. He had another drink and wandered off on a tour of inspection. Ford was standing before the integrators, studying them speculatively. He refused Crockett's offer of a highball. No thanks. These things are all right now, I believe. The downbeat is completely gone. You ought to have a drink, said Crockett. We've been through something, brother. This stuff relaxes you. It eases the letdown. No, I must make out my report. The integrators are such beautifully logical devices, it would be a pity to have them crack up. Luckily, they won't. Now that I've proved it's possible to cure insanity by induction. Crockett leered at the integrators. Little devils, look at them, squatting there as though butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. Hmm. When will the blizzard let up? I want to arrange for a plane. Can't tell. The one before last didn't stop for a week. This one? Crockett shrugged. I'll try to find out, but I won't make any promises. I'm anxious to get back. Well, Crockett said. He took the lift, went back to his office, and checked incoming calls, listing the questions he must feed into the integrators. One of them was important— a geological matter from the California Subtech Quake Control, but it could wait till all the calls were gathered. Crockett decided against another drink. For some reason, he hadn't fulfilled his intention of getting tight. Ordinary relief had proved a strong intoxicant. Now, whistling softly, he gathered the sheaf of items and started back toward the brain pan. The station looked swell, he thought. Maybe it was the knowledge that he'd had a reprieve from a death sentence. Only it had been worse than knowledge of certain death, that damned downbeat. Ah! He got into the lift, a railed platform working on old-fashioned elevator principles. Magnetic lifts couldn't be used near the integrators. He pushed the button, and, looking down, saw the brain pan beneath him, the white cylinders dwarfed by perspective. Footsteps sounded. Turning, Crockett discovered Ford running toward him. The lift was already beginning to drop, and Crockett's fingers went hastily toward the stop stud. He changed his mind as Ford raised his hand and exhibited a pistol. The bullet smashed into Crockett's thigh. He went staggering back till he hit the rail, and by that time Ford had leaped into the elevator— his face no longer prim and restrained, his eyes blazing with madness, and his lips wetly slack. He yelled gibberish and squeezed the trigger again. Crockett desperately flung himself forward. The bullet missed, though he could not be sure, and his hurtling body smashed against Ford. The psychologist, caught off balance, fell against the rail. As he tried to fire again, Crockett his legs buckling, sent his fist toward Ford's jaw. The timing, the balance were fatally right. Ford went over the rail. After a long time, Crockett heard the body strike, far down. The lift sank smoothly. The gun still lay on the platform. Crockett, groaning, began to tear his shirt into an improvised tourniquet. The wound in his thigh was bleeding badly. The cold light of the fluorescence showed the towers of the integrators, their tops level with Crockett now, and then rising as he continued to drop. If he looked over the edge of the platform, he could see Ford's body, but he would see it soon enough anyway. It was utterly silent. Tension, of course, and delayed reaction. Ford should have got drunk. Liquor would have made a buffer against the violent reaction from those long weeks of hell. Weeks of battling the downbeat, months in which Ford had kept himself keenly alert, visualizing the menace as a personified antagonist, keying himself up to a completely abnormal pitch. Then, success, and the cessation of the downbeat, and silence, deadly, terrifying. Time to relax and think and Ford going mad. 
He had said something about that weeks ago, Crockett remembered. Some psychologists have a tendency toward mental instability. That's why they gravitate into the field, and why they understand it. The lift stopped. Ford's motionless body was about a yard away. Crockett could not see the man's face. Insanity. Manic depressives are fairly simple cases. The schizophrenic are more complex and incurable. Incurable. Dr. Ford was a schizoid type. He had said that weeks ago. And now Dr. Ford, a victim of schizophrenic insanity, had died by violence as Bronson had died. Thirty white pillars stood in the brain pan, cryptically impassive, and Crockett looked at them with the beginning of a slow, dull horror. Thirty radioatom brains, super-sensitive, ready to record a new pattern on the blank wax discs. Not manic-depressive this time, not the downbeat. On the contrary, it would be uncharted, incurable, schizophrenic insanity. A mental explosion. Yeah. Dr. Ford, lying there dead, a pattern of madness fixed in his brain at the moment of death. A pattern that might be anything. Crockett watched the thirty integrators, and wondered what was going on inside those gleaming white shells. He would find out before the blizzard ended, he thought, with a sick horror for the station was haunted again. The Republic of the Southern Cross by Valery Brusov 1. There have appeared lately a whole series of descriptions of the dreadful catastrophe which has overtaken the Republic of the Southern Cross. They are strikingly various, and give many details of a manifestly fantastic and improbable character. Evidently, The writers of these descriptions have lent a too ready ear to the narratives of the survivors from Star City, Zviozny, the inhabitants of which, as is common knowledge, were all stricken with a psychical distemper. For that reason we consider it opportune to give an account here of all the reliable evidence which we have as yet of this tragedy of the Southern Pole. The Republic of the Southern Cross came into being some forty years ago, as a development from three hundred steelworks established in the southern polar regions. In a circular note sent to each and every government of the whole world, the new state expressed its pretensions to all lands, whether mainland or island, within the limits of the Antarctic Circle, as also all parts of these lands stretching beyond the line. It announced its readiness to purchase from the various other states affected the lands which they considered to be under their special protectorate. The pretensions of the new republic did not meet with any opposition on the part of the fifteen great powers of the world. Debatable points concerning certain islands lying entirely outside the polar circle, but closely related to the southern polar state, were settled by special treaties. On the fulfilment of the various formalities— The Republic of the Southern Cross was received into the family of world states, and its representatives were recognized by all governments. The chief city of the Republic, having the name of Zviozny, was situated at the actual pole itself, at that imaginary point where the Earth's axis passes and all earthly meridians become one, stood the town hall, and the roof with its pointed towers looked upon the nadir of the heavens. The streets of the town extended along meridians from the town hall, and these meridians were intersected by other streets in concentric circles. The height of all the buildings was the same, as was also their external appearance. There were no windows in the walls, as all the houses were lit by electricity, and the streets were lighted by electricity. 
Because of the severity of the climate, an impenetrable and opaque roof had been built over the town, with powerful ventilators for a constant change of air. These localities of the globe have but one day in six months, and one long night also of six months, but the streets of Zviozny were always lighted by a bright and even light. In the same way, in all seasons of the year, the temperature of the streets was kept at one and the same height. According to the last census, the population of Zviozny had reached two and a half millions. The whole of the remaining population of the Republic, numbering fifty millions, were concentrated in the neighbourhood of the ports and factories. These other points were also marked by the settlement of millions of people, in towns which, in external characteristics, were reminiscent of Zviozny. Thanks to a clever application of electric power, the entrance to the local havens remained open all the year round. Overhead electric railways connected the most populated parts of the Republic, and every day tens of thousands of people and millions of kilograms of material passed along these roads from one town to another. The interior of the country remained uninhabited. Travellers looking out of the train window saw before them only monotonous wildernesses, white in winter, and overgrown with wretched grass during the three months of summer. Wild animals had long since been destroyed, and for human beings there was no means of sustenance. The more remarkable was the hustling life of the ports and industrial centres. In order to give some understanding of the life, it is perhaps enough to say that of late years about seven-tenths of the whole of the world's output of metal has come from the state mines of the Republic. The Constitution of the Republic, according to outward signs, appeared to be the realization of extreme democracy. The only fully enfranchised citizens were the metal workers, who numbered about sixty per cent of the whole population. The factories and mines were state property. The life of the miners was facilitated by all possible conveniences, and even with luxury. At their disposal, apart from magnificent accommodation and a recherche cuisine, were various educational institutions and means of amusement. Libraries, museums, theatres, concerts, halls for all types of sport, etc. The number of working hours in the day was small in the extreme. The training and teaching of children, the giving of medical and legal aid, and the ministry of the various religious cults were all taken upon itself by the state. Ample provision for all the needs and even whims of the workmen of the state factories having been made, no wages whatever were paid. But families of citizens who had served twenty years in a factory, or who in their years of service had died or become enfeebled, received a handsome life pension on condition that they did not leave the Republic. From the workmen, by universal ballot, the representatives of the law-making chamber of the Republic were elected, and this chamber had cognizance of all the questions of the political life of the country, being, however, without power to alter its fundamental laws. It must be said that this democratic exterior concealed the purely autocratic tyranny of the shareholders and directors of a former trust. Giving up to others the places of deputies in the chamber, they inevitably brought in their own candidates as directors of the factories. In the hands of the board of directors was concentrated the economic life of the country. The directors received all the orders, and assigned them to the various factories for fulfilment. They purchased the materials and the machines for the work. They managed the whole business of the factories. Through their hands passed immense sums of money, to be reckoned in milliards. The law-making chamber only certified the entries of debits and credits in the upkeep of the factories, the accounts being handed to it for that purpose, and the balance on these accounts greatly exceeded the whole budget of the Republic. The influence of the board of directors in the international relationships of the Republic was immense. Its decisions might ruin whole countries. The prices fixed by them determine the wages of millions of labouring masses over the whole earth. And, moreover, the influence of the board, though indirect, was always decisive in the internal affairs of the Republic.
The lawmaking chamber, in fact, appeared to be the only humble servant of the will of the board. For the preservation of power in its own hands, the board was obliged to regulate mercilessly the whole life of the country. Though appearing to have liberty, the life of the citizens was standardized even to the most minute details. The buildings of all the towns of the Republic were according to one and the same pattern fixed by law. The decoration of all buildings used by the workmen, though luxurious to a degree, were strictly uniform. All received exactly the same food at exactly the same time. The clothes given out from the government stores were unchanging, and in the course of tens of years were of one and the same cut. At a signal from the town hall, at a definite hour, it was forbidden to go out of the houses. The whole press of the country was subject to a sharp censorship. No articles directed against the dictatorship of the board were allowed to see light. But, as a matter of fact, the whole country was so convinced of the benefit of this dictatorship, that the compositors themselves would have refused to set the type of articles criticizing the board. The factories were full of the board's spies. At the slightest manifestation of discontent with the board, the spies hastened to arrange meetings and dissuade the doubters with passionate speeches. The fact that the life of the workmen of the Republic was the object of the envy of the entire world was of course a disarming argument. It is said that, in cases of continued agitation by certain individuals, the board did not hesitate to resort to political murder. In any case, during the whole existence of the Republic, the universal ballot of the citizens never brought to power one representative who was hostile to the directors. The population of Zviozny was composed chiefly of workmen who had served their time. They were, so to speak, government shareholders. The means which they received from the state allowed them to live richly. It is not astonishing, therefore, that Zviozny was reckoned one of the gayest cities of the world. For various entrepreneurs and entertainers it was a gold mine. The celebrities of the world brought hither their talents. Here were the best operas, best concerts, best exhibitions. Here were brought out the best informed gazettes. The shops of Zviozny amazed by the richness of their choice of goods. The restaurants by the luxury and the delicacy of their service. Resorts of evil, where all forms of debauch invented in either the ancient or the modern world were to be found, abounded. However, the governmental regulation of life was preserved in Zviozny also. It is true that the decorations of lodgings and the fashions of dress were not compulsorily determined, but the law forbidding the exit from the house after a certain hour remained in force, a strict censorship of the press was maintained, and many spies were kept by the board. Order was officially maintained by the popular police, but at the same time there existed the secret police of the all-cognizant board. Such was in its general character the system of life in the Republic of the Southern Cross, and in its capital. The problem of the future historian will be to determine how much this system was responsible for the outbreak and spread of that fatal disease which brought to destruction the town of Zviozny, and with it, perhaps, the whole young republic. The first cases of the disease of contradiction were observed in the republic some twenty years ago. It had then the character of a rare and sporadic malady. Nevertheless, the local mental experts were much interested by it, and gave a circumstantial account of the symptoms at the International Medical Congress at Lhasa, where several reports of it were read. Later it was somehow or other forgotten, though in the mental hospitals of Zviozny there never was any difficulty in finding examples. The disease received its name from the fact that the victims continuously contradicted their wishes by their actions, wishing one thing but saying and doing another. The scientific name of the disease is Mania Contradices. It begins with fairly feeble symptoms, generally those of characteristic aphasia. The stricken, instead of saying yes, say no. Wishing to say caressing words, they splutter abuse, etc. 
the majority also begin to contradict themselves in their behavior. Intending to go to the left, they turn to the right. Thinking to raise the brim of a hat so as to see better, they would pull it down over their eyes instead, and so on. As the disease develops, contradiction overtakes the whole of the bodily and spiritual life of the patient, exhibiting infinite diversity conformable with the idiosyncrasies of each. In general, the speech of the patient becomes unintelligible, and his actions absurd. The normality of the physiological functions of the organism is disturbed. Acknowledging the unwisdom of his behavior, the patient gets into a state of extreme excitement, bordering even upon insanity. Many commit suicide, sometimes in fits of madness, sometimes in moments of spiritual brightness. Others perish from a rush of blood to the brain. In almost all cases, the disease is mortal. Cases of recovery are extremely rare. The epidemic character was taken by Mania Contradiches during the middle months of this year in Zviozny. Up until this time, the number of cases had never exceeded two percent of the total number of patients in the hospitals. But this proportion suddenly rose to twenty-five percent during the month of May, autumn month as it is called in the Republic, and it continued to increase during the succeeding months with as great rapidity. By the middle of June, there were already two percent of the whole population, that is, about fifty thousand people, officially notified as suffering from contradiction. We have no statistical details of any later date. The hospitals overflowed. The doctors on the spot proved to be altogether insufficient. And, moreover, the doctors themselves and the nurses in the hospitals caught the disease also. There was very soon no one to whom to appeal for medical aid, and a correct register of patients became impossible. The evidence given by eyewitnesses, however, is in agreement on this point, that it was impossible to find a family in which someone was not suffering. The number of healthy people rapidly decreased as panic caused a wholesale exodus from the town, but the number of the stricken increased. It is probably true that in the month of August, all who had remained in Zviozny were down with this psychical malady. It is possible to follow the first developments of the epidemic by the columns of the local newspapers, headed in ever larger type as the mania grew. Since the detection of the disease in its early stages was very difficult, the chronicle of the first days of the epidemic is full of comic episodes. A train conductor on the Metropolitan Railway, instead of receiving money from the passengers, himself pays them. A policeman, whose duty it was to regulate the traffic, confuses it all day long. A visitor to a gallery, walking from room to room, turns all the pictures with their faces to the wall. A newspaper page of proof, being corrected by the hand of a reader already overtaken by the disease, is printed next morning full of the most amusing absurdities. At a concert, a sick violinist suddenly interrupts the harmonious efforts of the orchestra, with the most dreadful dissonances. A whole long series of such happenings gave plenty of scope for the wits of local journalists. But several instances of a different type of phenomenon caused the jokes to come to a sudden end. The first was that a doctor overtaken by the disease prescribed poison for a girl patient in his care, and she perished. For three days the newspapers were taken up with this circumstance. Then— Two nurses walking in the town gardens were overtaken by contradiction, and cut the throats of forty-one children. This event staggered the whole city. But on the evening of the same day, two victims fired the mitrailleurs from the quarters of the town militia, and killed and injured some five hundred people. At that, all the newspapers and the society of the town cried for prompt measures against the epidemic. At a special session— of the combined board and legal chamber, it was decided to invite doctors from other towns and from abroad to enlarge the existing hospitals, to build new ones, and to construct everywhere isolation barracks for the sufferers, to print and distribute five hundred thousand copies of a brochure on the disease, its symptoms and means of cure, 
to organize on all the streets of the town a special patrol of doctors and their helpers for the giving of first aid to those who had not been removed from private lodgings. It was also decided to run special trains daily on all the railways for the removal of the patients, as the doctors were of opinion that change of air was one of the best remedies. Similar measures were undertaken at the same time by various associations, societies, and clubs. A society for struggle with the epidemic was even founded, and the members gave themselves to the work with remarkable self-devotion. But in spite of all these measures, the epidemic gained ground each day, taking in its course old men and little children, working people and resting people, chaste and debauched. And soon the whole of society was enveloped in the unconquerable elemental terror of the unheard-of calamity. The flight from Zviozny commenced. At first, only a few fled— and these were prominent dignitaries, directors, members of the legal chamber and of the board, who hastened to send their families to the southern cities of Australia and Patagonia. Following them, the accidental elements of the population fled, those foreigners gladly sojourning in the gayest city of the southern hemisphere, theatrical artists, various business agents, women of light behavior. When the epidemic showed no signs of abating— the shopkeepers fled. They hurriedly sold off their goods and left their empty premises to the will of fate. With them went the bankers, the owners of theatres and restaurants, the editors and the publishers. At last, even the established inhabitants were moved to go. According to law, the exit of workmen from the Republic without special sanction from the government was forbidden on pain of loss of pension. Deserters began to increase— The employees of the town institutions fled, the militia fled, the hospital nurses fled, the chemists, the doctors. The desire to flee became in its turn a mania. Everyone fled who could. The stations of the electric railway were crushed with immense crowds, tickets were bought for huge sums of money, and only held by fighting. For a place in a dirigible, which took only ten passengers— One paid a whole fortune. At the moment of the going out of trains, new people would break into the compartments and take up places which they would not relinquish except by compulsion. Crowds stopped the trains which had been fitted up exclusively for patients, dragged the latter out of the carriages, and compelled the engine drivers to go on. From the end of May, train service, except between the capital and the ports, ceased to work. From Zviozny the trains went out over full, passengers standing on the steps and in the corridors, even daring to cling on outside, despite the fact that with the speed of contemporary electric railways, any person doing such a thing risks suffocation. The steamship companies of Australia, South America and South Africa grew inordinately rich, transporting the refugees of the Republic to other lands. The two southern companies of dirigibles were not less prosperous, accomplishing, as they did, ten journeys a day, and bringing away from Zviozny the last belated millionaires. On the other hand, trains arrived at Zviozny almost empty. For no wages was it possible to persuade people to come to work at the capital. Only now and again, eccentric tourists and seekers of new sensations arrived at the towns. It is reckoned, that from the beginning of the exodus to the 22nd of June, when the regular service of trains ceased, there passed out of Zviozny by the six railroads some million and a half people, that is, almost two-thirds of the whole population. 2. By his enterprise, valour, and strength of will, one man earned for himself eternal fame— and that was the president of the board, Horace Deville. At the special session of the 5th of June, Deville was elected, both by the board and by the legal chamber, dictator over the town, and was given the title of Nachalnik. He had sole control of the town treasury, of the militia, and of the municipal institutions. At that time it was decided to remove from Zviozny to a northern port the government of the Republic and the archives. 
the name of Horace de Ville should be written in letters of gold among the most famous names of history. For six weeks he struggled with the growing anarchy in the town. He succeeded in gathering around him a group of helpers as unselfish as himself. He was able to enforce discipline, both in the militia and in the municipal service generally, for a considerable time, though these bodies were terrified by the general calamity and decimated by the epidemic. Hundreds of thousands owe their escape to Horace de Ville, as, thanks to his energy and organizing power, it was possible for them to leave. He lightened the misery of the last days of thousands of others, giving them the possibility of dying in hospitals, carefully looked after, and not simply being stoned or beaten to death by the mad crowd. And Deville preserved for mankind the chronicle of the catastrophe, for one cannot but consider as a chronicle his short but pregnant telegrams, sent several times a day from the town of Zviozny to the temporary residence of the government of the Republic at the northern port. Deville's first work on becoming Nachalnik of the town was to attempt to restore calm to the population. He issued manifestos proclaiming that the psychical infection was most quickly caught by people who were excited, and he called upon all healthy and balanced persons to use their authority to restrain the weak and nervous. Then, Deville used the Society for Struggle with the Epidemic and put under the authority of its members all public places, theatres, meeting-houses, squares, and streets. In these days there scarcely ever passed an hour but a new case of infection might be discovered. Now here, now there, one saw faces, or whole groups of faces, manifestly expressive of abnormality. The greater number of the patients, when they understood their condition, showed an immediate desire for help. But under the influence of the disease, this wish expressed itself in various types of hostile action directed against these standing near. The stricken wished to hasten home or to a hospital, but instead of doing this, they fled in fright to the outskirts of the town. The thought occurred to them to ask the passerby to do something for them, but instead of that, they seized him by the throat. In this way, many were suffocated, struck down or wounded with knife or stick. So the crowd, whenever it found itself in the presence of a man suffering from contradiction, took to flight. At these moments, the members of the society would appear on the scene, capture the sick man, calm him, and take him to the nearest hospital. It was their work to reason with the crowd, and explain that there was really no danger— that the general misfortune had simply spread a little further, and it was their duty to struggle with it to the full extent of their powers. The sudden infection of persons present in the audience of theatres or meeting-houses often led to the most tragic catastrophes. Once, at a performance of opera, some hundreds of people stricken mad in a mass instead of expressing their approval of the vocalists, flung themselves on the stage and scattered blows right and left. At the Grand Dramatic Theatre, an actor, whose role it was to commit suicide by a revolver shot, fired the revolver several times at the public. It was, of course, blank cartridge. But it so acted on the nerves of those present that it hastened the symptoms of the disease in many in whom it was latent. In the confusion which followed, several scores of people were killed. But worst of all was that which happened in the theatre of fireworks. The detachment of militia posted there, in case of fire, suddenly set fire to the stage, and to the veils by which the various light effects are obtained. Not less than two hundred people were burnt or crushed to death. After that occurrence, Horace de Ville closed all the theatres and concert rooms in the town. The robbers and thieves now began to constitute a grave danger for the inhabitants, and in the general disorganization they were able to carry their depredations very far. It is said that some of them came to Zviozny from abroad. Some simulated madness in order to escape punishment— Others felt it unnecessary to make any pretense of disguising their open robberies. 
Gangs of thieves entered the abandoned shops, broke into private lodgings, and took off the more valuable things, or demanded gold. They stopped people in the streets and stripped them of their valuables, such as watches, rings, and bracelets. And there accompanied the robberies outrage of every kind, even of the most disgusting. The Nachalnik sent companies of militia to hunt down the criminals, but they did not dare to join in open conflict. There were dreadful moments when, among the militia or among the robbers, would suddenly appear a case of the disease, and friend would turn his weapon against friend. At first, the Nachalnik banished from the town the robbers who fell under arrest, but those who had charge of the prison trains liberated them in order to take their places. Then the Nachalnik was obliged to condemn the criminals to death. So, almost after three centuries' break, capital punishment was introduced once more on the earth. In June, a general scarcity of the indispensable articles of food and medicine began to make itself felt. The import by rail diminished. Manufacture within the town practically ceased. Deville organized the town bakeries and the distribution of bread and meat to the people. In the town itself, the same common tables were set up as had long since been established in the factories. But it was not possible to find sufficient people for kitchen and service. Some voluntary workers toiled till they were exhausted, and they gradually diminished in numbers. The town crematoriums flamed all day, but the number of corpses did not decrease, but increased. They began to find bodies in the streets and left in houses. The municipal business, such as telegraph, telephone, electric light, water supply, sanitation, and the rest, were worked by fewer and fewer people. It is astonishing how much Deville succeeded in doing. He looked after everything— and every one. One conjectures that he never knew a moment's rest, and all who were saved testify unanimously that his activity was beyond praise. Towards the middle of June, shortage of labour on the railways began to be felt. There were not enough engine drivers or conductors. On the 17th of June, the first accident took place on the southwestern line, the reason being the sudden attack of the engine driver. In the paroxysm of his disease, the driver took his train over a precipice onto a glacier, and almost all the passengers were killed or crippled. The news of this was brought to the town by the next train, and it came as a thunderbolt. A hospital train was sent off at once. It brought back the dead and the crippled, but towards the evening of that day news was circulated that a similar catastrophe had taken place on the first line. Two of the railway tracks connecting Zviozny with the outside world were damaged. Breakdown gangs were sent from Zviozny and from Northport to repair the lines, but it was almost impossible because of the winter temperature. There was no hope that on these lines train service would be resumed, at least in the near future. These catastrophes were simply patterns for new ones, the more alarmed the engine drivers became, the more liable they were to the disease, and to the repetition of the mistake of their predecessors. Just because they were afraid of destroying a train, they destroyed it. During the five days from the 18th to the 22nd of June, seven trains with passengers were wrecked. Thousands of passengers perished from injuries or starved to death unrescued in the snowy wastes. Only very few had sufficient strength to return to the city by their own efforts. The six main lines connecting Zviozny with the outer world were rendered useless. The service of dirigibles had ceased earlier. One of them had been destroyed by the enraged mob, the pretext given being that they were used exclusively for the rich. The others, one by one, were wrecked, the disease probably attacking the crew. The population of the city— was at this time about six hundred thousand. For some time, they were only connected with the world by telegraph. On the 24th of June, the Metropolitan Railway ceased to run. On the 26th, the telephone service was discontinued. On the 27th, 
All chemist shops, except the large central store, were closed. On the first of July, the inhabitants were ordered to come from the outer parts of the town into the central districts, so that order might better be maintained, food distributed, and medical aid afforded. Suburban dwellers abandoned their own quarters and settled in those which had lately been abandoned by fugitives. The sense of property vanished. No one was sorry to leave his own. No one felt it strange to take up his abode in other people's houses. Nevertheless, burglars and robbers did not disappear, though perhaps now one would rather call them demented beings than criminals. They continued to steal, and great hoards of gold have been discovered in the empty houses where they hid them, and precious stones beside the decaying body of the robber himself. It is astonishing that in the midst of universal destruction, life tended to keep its former course. There still were shopkeepers who opened their shops and sold for incredible sums the luxuries, flowers, books, guns, and other goods which they had preserved. Purchasers threw down their unnecessary gold ungrudgingly, and miserly merchants hid it, God knows why. There still existed secret resorts with cards, women, and wine, with their unfortunate sought refuge and tried to forget dreadful reality. There the whole mingled with the diseased, and there is no chronicle of the scenes which took place. Two or three newspapers still try to preserve the significance of the written word in the midst of desolation. Copies of these newspapers are being sold now at ten or twenty times their original value, and will undoubtedly become bibliographical rarities of the first degree. In their columns is reflected the horrors of the unfortunate town, described in the midst of the reigning madness, and set by half-mad compositors. There were reporters who took note of the happenings of the town, journalists who debated hotly the condition of affairs, and even feuilletonists who endeavoured to enliven these tragic days. But the telegrams received from other countries, telling as they did of real healthy life, caused the souls of the readers in Zviozny to fall into despair. There were desperate attempts to escape. At the beginning of July, an immense crowd of women and children, led by a certain John Dew, decided to set out on foot for the nearest inhabited place, London Town. Deville understood the madness of this attempt, but could not stop the people, and himself supplied them with warm clothing and provisions. This whole crowd of about two thousand people were lost in the snow and in the continuous polar night. A certain whiting started to preach a more heroic remedy. This was to kill all who were suffering from the disease, and he held that after that the epidemic would cease. He found a considerable number of adherents, though in those dark days the wildest, most inhuman proposal which in any way promised deliverance would have obtained attention. Whiting and his friends broke into every house in the town, and destroyed whatever sick they found. They massacred the patients in the hospitals. They even killed those suspected to be unwell. Robbers and madmen joined themselves to these bands of ideal murderers. The whole town became their arena. In these difficult days, Horace de Ville organized his fellow workers into a military force, encouraged them with his spirit, and set out to fight the followers of Whiting. This affair lasted several days. Hundreds of men fell on one side or the other, till at last Whiting himself was taken. He appeared to be in the last stages of mania contra dices, and had to be taken to the hospital, where he soon perished, instead of to the scaffold. On the 8th of July, one of the worst things happened— the controller of the central power station smashed all the machinery. The electric light failed, and the whole city was plunged in absolute darkness. As there was no other means of lighting and warming the city, the people were left in a helpless plight. Deville had, however, foreseen such an eventuality, and had accumulated a considerable quantity of torches and fuel. Bonfires were lighted in all the streets— Torches were distributed in thousands. 
but these miserable lights could not illumine the gigantic perspectives of the city of Zviozny, the tens of kilometers of straight-line highways, the gloomy height of thirteen-story buildings. With the darkness, the last discipline of the city was lost. Terror and madness finally possessed all souls. The healthy could not be distinguished from the sick. There commenced a dreadful orgy of the despairing. The moral sense of the people declined with astonishing rapidity. Culture slipped from off these people like a delicate bark, and revealed man, wild and naked, the man-beast as he was. All sense of right was lost. Force alone was acknowledged. For women, the only law became that of desire and of indulgence. The most virtuous matrons behaved as the most abandoned, with no continence or faith, and used the vile language of the tavern. Young girls ran about the streets demented and unchaste. Drunkards made feasts in ruined cellars, not in any way distressed that amongst the bottles lay unburied corpses. All this was constantly aggravated by the breaking out of the disease afresh. Sad was the position of children, abandoned by their parents to the will of fate. They died of hunger, of injury after assault, and they were murdered both purposely and by accident. It is even affirmed that cannibalism took place. In this last period of tragedy, Horace de Ville could not, of course, afford help to the whole population, but he did arrange in the town hall shelter for those who still preserve their reason. The entrances to the building were barricaded, and sentries were kept continuously on guard. There was food and water for three thousand people for forty days. De Ville, however, had only eighteen hundred people— and though there must have been other people with sound minds in the town, they could not have known what Deville was doing, and these remained in hiding in the houses. Many resolved to remain indoors till the end, and bodies have been found of many who must have died of hunger in their solitude. It is remarkable that among those who took refuge in the town hall, there were very few new cases of the disease— Deville was able to keep discipline in his small community. He kept till the last a journal of all that happened, and that journal, together with the telegrams, makes the most reliable source of evidence of the catastrophe. The journal was found in a secret cupboard of the town hall, where the most precious documents were kept. The last entry refers to the 20th of July. Deville writes that a demented crowd is assailing the building— and that he is obliged to fire with revolvers upon the people. What I hope for, he adds, I know not. No help can be expected before the spring. We have not the food to live till the spring. But I shall fulfil my duty to the end. These were the last words of Deville. Noble words. It must be added that on the 21st of July, the crowd took the town hall by storm— and its defenders were all killed or scattered. The body of Deville has not yet been found, and there is no reliable evidence as to what took place in the town after the 21st. It must be conjectured, from the state in which the town was found, that anarchy reached its last limits. The gloomy streets, lit up by the glare of bonfires of furniture and books, can be imagined. They obtained fire by striking iron on flint. Crowds of drunkards and madmen danced wildly about the bonfires. Men and women drank together, and passed the common cap from lip to lip. The worst scenes of sensuality were witnessed. Some sort of dark, atavistic sense enlivened the souls of these townsmen, and, half-naked, unwashed, unkempt, they danced the dances of their remote ancestors, the contemporaries of the cave bears— and they sang the same wild songs as did the hordes when they fell with stone axes upon the mammoth. With songs, with incoherent exclamations, with idiotic laughter, mingled the cries of those who had lost the power to express in words their own delirious dreams, mingled also the moans of those in the convulsions of death. Sometimes dancing gave way to fighting, for a barrel of wine, for a woman— 
or simply without reason, in a fit of madness brought about by contradictory emotion. There was nowhere to flee. The same dreadful scenes were everywhere, the same orgies everywhere, the same fights, the same brutal gaiety or brutal rage, or else absolute darkness, which seemed more dreadful, even more intolerable, to the staggered imagination. Zviozny became an immense black box, in which were some thousands of man-resembling beings, abandoned in the foul air from hundreds of thousands of dead bodies, where amongst the living was not one who understood his own position. This was the city of the senseless, the gigantic madhouse, the greatest and most disgusting bedlam which the world has ever seen. And the madmen destroyed one another, stabbed or strangled one another, died of madness, died of terror, died of hunger, and of all the diseases which reigned in the infected air. It goes without saying that the government of the Republic did not remain indifferent to the great calamity which had overtaken the capital, but it very soon became clear that no help whatever could be given, no doctors, nurses, officers, or workmen of any kind would agree to go to Zviozny. After the breakdown of the railroad service and of the airships, it was, of course, impossible to get there, the climactic conditions being too great an obstacle. Moreover, the attention of the government was soon absorbed by cases of the disease appearing in other towns of the Republic. In some of these it threatened to take on the same epidemic character, and a social panic set in that was akin to what happened in Zviozny itself. A wholesale exodus from the more populated parts of the Republic commenced. The work in all the mines came to a standstill, and the entire industrial life of the country faded away. But thanks, however, to strong measures taken in time, the progress of the disease was arrested in these towns, and nowhere did it reach the proportions witnessed in the capital. The anxiety with which the whole world followed the misfortunes of the young republic is well known. At first no one dreamed that the trouble could grow to what it did, and the dominant feeling was that of curiosity. The chief newspapers of the world, and in that number our own northern European evening news, sent their own special correspondents to Zviozny, to write up the epidemic. Many of these brave knights of the pen became victims of their own professional obligations. When the news became more alarming, various foreign governments and private societies offered their services to the Republic. Some sent troops, others doctors, others money, but the catastrophe developed with such rapidity that this goodwill could not obtain fulfilment. After the breakdown of the railway service, the only information received from Zviozny was that of the telegrams sent by the Nachalnik. These telegrams were forwarded to the ends of the earth and printed in millions of copies. After the wreck of the electrical apparatus, the telegraph service lasted still a few days longer, thanks to the accumulators of the powerhouse. There is no accurate information as to why the telegraph service ceased altogether. Perhaps the apparatus was destroyed. The last telegram of Horace Deville was that of the 27th of June. From that date, for almost six weeks, humanity remained without news of the capital of the Republic. During July, several attempts were made to reach Vyozny by air. Several new airships and aeroplanes were received by the Republic. But for a long time all efforts to reach the city failed. At last, however, the aeronaut, Thomas Billy, succeeded in flying to the unhappy town. He picked up from the roof of the town two people in an extreme state of hunger and mental collapse. Looking through the ventilators, Billy saw that the streets were plunged in absolute darkness, but he heard wild cries, and understood that there were still living human beings in the town. Billy, however, did not dare to let himself down into the town itself. Towards the end of August, one line of the electric railway was put in order as far as the station Lysis, a hundred and five kilometres from the town. A detachment of well-armed men passed into the town, 
bearing food and medical first aid, entering by the northwestern gates. They, however, could not penetrate further than the first blocks of buildings, because of the dreadful atmosphere. They had to do their work step by step, clearing the bodies from the streets, disinfecting the air as they went. The only people whom they met were completely irresponsible. They resembled wild animals in their ferocity, and had to be captured and held by force. About the middle of September, train service with Zviozny was once more established, and trains went regularly. At the time of writing, the greater part of the town has already been cleared. Electric light and heating are once more in working order. The only part of the town which has not been dealt with is the American quarter, but it is thought that there are no living beings there. About ten thousand people have been saved, but the greater number are apparently incurable. Those who have to any degree recovered evince a strong disinclination to speak of the life they have gone through. What is more, their stories are full of contradiction, and often not confirmed by documentary evidence. Various newspapers of the last days of July have been found. The latest to date, that of the 22nd of July, gives the news of the death of Horace Deville, and the invitation of shelter in the town hall. There are indeed some other pages marked August, but the words printed thereon make it clear that the author— who was probably setting in type his own delirium, was quite irresponsible. The diary of Horace Deville was discovered, with its regular chronicle of events from the 28th of June to the 20th of July. The frenzies of the last days in the town are luridly witnessed by the things discovered in streets and houses. Mutilated bodies, everywhere the bodies of the starved, of the suffocated, of those murdered by the insane— and some even half-eaten. Bodies were found in the most unexpected places, in the tunnels of the Metropolitan Railway, in sewers, in various sheds, in boilers. The demented had sought refuge from the surrounding terrors in all possible places. The interiors of most houses had been wrecked, and the booty which robbers had found it impossible to dispose of had been hidden in secret rooms and cellars. It will certainly be several months before Zviozny will become habitable once more. Now it is almost empty. The town, which could accommodate three million people, has but thirty thousand workmen, who are cleansing the streets and houses. A good number of the former inhabitants who had previously fled have returned, however, to seek the bodies of their relatives, and to glean the remains of their lost fortunes. Several tourists, attracted by the amazing spectacle of the empty town, have also arrived. Two businessmen have opened hotels, and are doing pretty well. A small café chanton is to be opened shortly, the troupe for which has already been engaged. The Northern European Evening News has for its part sent out a new correspondent, Mr. Andrew Eval and hopes to obtain circumstantial news of all the fresh discoveries which may be made in the unfortunate capital of the Republic of the Southern Cross. THE ICE DEMON by Clark Ashton Smith Quanga the Huntsman, with whom Phethos and Ibersanth, two of the most enterprising jewellers of Iqua, had crossed the borders of a region into which men went but seldom, and wherefrom they returned even more rarely. Travelling north from Iqua, they had passed into desolate Muthulan, where the great glacier of Pelerion had rolled like a frozen sea upon wealthy and far-famed cities, covering the broad isthmus from shore to shore beneath fathoms of perpetual ice. The shell-shaped domes of Cerngoth, it was fabled, 
could still be seen deep down in the glaciation, and the high, keen spires of Ogon's eye were embedded therein, together with fern palm and mammoth, and the square black temples of the god Sathagur. All this had occurred many centuries ago, and still the ice, a mighty glittering rampart, was moving south upon deserted lands. Now, in the path of the embattled glacier, Quanga led his companions on a bold quest. Their object was nothing less than the retrieval of the rubies of King Halla, who, with the wizard Omum Vog and many full caparisoned soldiers, had gone out five decades before to make war upon the polar ice. From this fantastic expedition neither Halla nor Omum Vog had come back, and the sorry, ragged remnant of their men-at-arms, returning to Iqua after two moons, had told a dire tale. The army, they said, had made its encampment on a sort of knoll, carefully chosen by Omum Vog, in full sight of the Vanwood Ice. Then the mighty sorcerer, standing with Haller amid a ring of braziers that fumed incessantly with golden smoke, and reciting runes that were older than the world, had conjured up a fiery orb, vaster and redder than the southward circling sun of heaven. And the orb, with blazing beams that smote from the zenith, torrid and effulgent, had caused the sun to seem no more than a daylight moon, and the soldiers had almost swooned from its heat in their heavy panoply. But beneath its beams the verges of the glacier melted and ran in swift rills and rivers, so that Halla for a time was hopeful of reconquering the realm of Mu Thulan, over which his forefathers had ruled in bygone ages. The rushing waters had deepened, flowing past the knoll on which the army waited. Then, as if by a hostile magic, the rivers began to give forth a pale and stifling mist that blinded the conjured son of Omum Vog, so that its sultry beams grew faint and chill, and had power no longer on the ice. Vainly the wizard had put forth other spells, trying to dissipate the deep and gelid fog. But the vapour drew down, evil and clammy, coiling and wreathing like knots of phantom serpents, and filling men's marrows as if with the cold of death. It covered all the camp, a tangible thing, ever colder and thicker, numbing the limbs of those who groped blindly, and could not see the faces of their fellows at arm's length. A few of the common soldiers somehow reached its outer confines, and crept fearfully away beneath the one sun, seeing no longer in the skies the wizard globe that had been called up by Omum Vog, and looking back presently, as they fled in strange terror, they beheld, instead of the low-lying mist they had thought to see, a newly frozen sheet of ice that covered the mound on which the king and the sorcerer had made their encampment. The ice rose higher above the ground than a tall man's head, and dimly, in its glittering depth, the fleeing soldiers saw the imprisoned forms of their leaders and companions. Deeming that this thing was no natural occurrence, but a sorcery that had been exerted by the great glacier, and that the glacier itself was a live, malignant entity with powers of unknown bale, they did not slacken their flight, and the ice had suffered them to depart in peace, as if to give warning of the fate of those who dared to assail it. Some there were who believed the tale, and some who doubted, but the kings that ruled in Iqua after Halla went not forth to do battle with the ice, and no wizard rose to make war upon it with conjured sons. Men fled before the ever-advancing glaciations, and strange legends were told of how people had been overtaken or cut off in lonely valleys by sudden diabolic shiftings of the ice, as if it had stretched out a living hand. And legends there were of awful crevasses that yawned abruptly, and closed like monstrous mouths upon them that dared the frozen waste, of winds like the breath of boreal demons that blasted men's flesh with instant, utter cold, and turned them into statues, hard as granite. In time the whole region, for many miles before the glacier, was generally shunned, and only the hardiest hunters would follow their quarry into that winter-blighted land. Now it happened that the fearless huntsman Illuak, 
the elder brother of Quanga, had gone into Mu Thulan, and had pursued an enormous black fox that led him afar on the mighty fields of the Ice Sheet. For many leagues he trailed it, coming never within bowshot of the beast, and at length he came to a great mound on the plain that seemed to mark the position of a buried hill. And Illuwak thought that the fox entered a cavern in the mound, so with the lifted bow and a poised arrow at the string, he went after it into the cavern. The place was like a chamber of boreal kings, or gods. All about him, in a dim green light, were huge, glimmering pillars, and giant icicles hung from the roof in the form of stalactites. The floor sloped downward, and Illuwak came to the cave's end without finding any trace of the fox. But in the transparent depth of the further wall, at the bottom, he saw the standing shapes of many men, deep frozen and sealed up as in a tomb, with undecaying bodies and fair, unshrunken features. The men were armed with tall spears, and most of them wore the panoply of soldiers. But among them, in the van, there stood a haughty figure, attired in the sea-blue robes of a king, and beside him was a bowed ancient who wore the night-black garb of a sorcerer. The robes of the regal figure were heavily sewn with gems that burned like coloured stars through the ice, and great rubies red as gouts of newly congealing blood were arranged in the lines of a triangle on the bosom, forming the royal sign of the kings of Iqua. So Illuak knew, by these tokens, that he had found the tomb of Haller and Omum Vogue, and the soldiers with whom they had gone up against the ice in former days. Overawed by the strangeness of it all, and remembering now the old legends, Illuak lost his courage for the first time, and quitted the chamber without delay. Nowhere could he find the black fox, and abandoning the chase, he returned southward, reaching the lands below the glacier without mishap. But he swore later that the ice had changed in a weird manner while he was following the fox, so that he was unsure of his direction for a while— after leaving the cavern. There were steep ridges and hummocks where none had been before, making his return a toilsome journey, and the glaciation seemed to extend itself for many miles beyond its former limits. And because of these things, which he could not explain or understand, a curious eerie fear was born in the heart of Illuwak. Never again did he go back upon the glacier, but he told his brother Quanger of that which he had found— and described the location of the cavern chamber, in which King Haller and Omum Vog and their men-at-arms were entombed. And soon after this, Illuwak was killed by a white bear, on which he had used all his arrows in vain. Quanga was no less brave than Illuwak, and he did not fear the glacier, since he had been upon it many times, and had noticed nothing untoward. His was a heart that lusted after gain, and often he thought of the rubies of Haller, locked with the king in eternal ice, and it seemed to him that a bold man might recover the rubies. So, one summer, while trading in Iqua with his furs, he went to the jewellers Ibersanth and Hum Phethos, taking with him a few garnets that he had found in a northern valley. While the jewellers were appraising the garnets, he spoke idly of the rubies of Haller, and inquired craftily as to their value. Then, hearing the great worth of the gems, and noting the greedy interest that was shown by whom Phethos and Ibersanth, he told them the tale he had heard from his brother Illuwak, and offered, if they would promise him half the value of the rubies, to guide them to the hidden cave. The jewellers agreed to this proposition. In spite of the hardships of the proposed journey— and the difficulty they might afterward encounter in disposing surreptitiously of gems that belonged to the royal family of Iqua, and would be claimed by the present king Ralor if their discovery were learned. The fabulous worth of the rubies had fired their avarice. Quanga, on his part, desired the complicity and connivance of the dealers, knowing that it would be hard for him to sell the jewels otherwise. He did not trust whom Phethos and Ibersanth, and it was for this reason that he required them to go with him to the cavern, and pay over to him the agreed sum of money as soon as they were in possession of the treasure. 
The strange trio had set forth in midsummer. Now, after two weeks of journeying through a wild, subarctic region, they were approaching the confines of the eternal ice. They travelled on foot, and their supplies were carried by three horses little larger than musk oxen. Quanga, an unerring marksman, hunted for their daily food the hares and waterfowl of the country. Behind them, in a cloudless turquoise heaven, there burned the low sun that was said to have described a loftier ecliptic in former ages. Drifts of unmelting snow were heaped in the shadows of the higher hills, and in steep valleys they came upon the vanward glaciers of the ice sheet. The trees and shrubs were already sparse and stunted, in a land where rich forests had flourished in olden time beneath a milder climate. But poppies flamed in the meadows and along the slopes, spreading their frail beauty like a scarlet rug before the feet of perennial winter, and the quiet pools and stagnant flowing streams were lined with white water lilies. A little to the east, they saw the fuming of volcanic peaks that still resisted the inroads of the glaciers. On the west were high, gaunt mountains whose sheer cliffs and pinnacles were topped with snow, and around whose nether slopes the ice had climbed like an inundating sea. Before them was the looming, crenellated wall of the realm-wide glaciation, moving equally on plain and hill, uprooting the trees, and pressing the soil forward in vast folds and ridges. Its progress had been stayed a little by the northern summer. Quanga and the jewellers, as they went on, came to turbid rills made by a temporary melting that issued from beneath the glittering blue-green ramparts. They left their pack-horses in a grassy valley, tethered by long cords of elk-thong to the dwarfish willows. Then, carrying such provisions and other equipment as they might require for a two-day's journey, they climbed the ice slope at a point selected by Quangra as being most readily accessible, and started in the direction of the cave that had been found by Illuak. Quangra took his bearings from the position of the volcanic mountains— and also from two isolated peaks that rose on the sheeted plain to the north, like the breasts of a giantess beneath her shining armor. The three were well equipped for all the exigencies of their search. Quanga carried a curious pickaxe of finely tempered bronze, to be used in disentombing the body of King Haller, and he was armed with a short, leaf-shaped sword, in addition to his bow and quiver of arrows. His garments were made from the fur of a giant bear, brown-black in color, whom Phethos and Ibis Santh, in raiment heavily quilted with eiderdown against the cold, followed him complainingly, but with avaricious eagerness. They had not enjoyed the long marches through a desolate, bleakening land, nor the rough fare and exposure to the northern elements. Moreover, they had taken a dislike to Quanga, whom they considered rude and overbearing. Their grievances were aggravated by the fact that he was now compelling them to carry most of the supplies, in addition to the two heavy bags of gold, which they were to exchange later for the gems. Nothing less valuable than the rubies of Hala would have induced them to come so far, or to set foot on the formidable wastes of the ice sheet. The scene before them was like some frozen world of the outer void, vast, Unbroken, save for a few scattered mounds and ridges, the plain extended to the white horizon and its armoured peaks. Nothing seemed to live or move on the awful, glistening vistas, whose nearer levels were swept clean of snow. The sun appeared to grow pale and chill, and to recede behind the adventurers, and a wind blew upon them from the ice, like a breath from abysses beyond the pole." Apart from the boreal desolation and dreariness, however, there was nothing to dismay Quanga or his companions. None of them were superstitious, and they deemed that the old tales were idle myths, were no more than fear-born delusions. Quanga smiled commiseratively at the thought of his brother Illuak, who had been so oddly frightened and had fancied such extraordinary things after the finding of Hala. It was a singular weakness in Illuak the rash and almost foolhardy hunter who had feared neither man nor beast. 
as to the trapping of Haller and Omum Vogue and their army in the glacier. It was plain that they had allowed themselves to be overtaken by the winter storms, and the few survivors, mentally unhinged by their hardships, had told a wild story. Ice, even though it had conquered half of a continent, was merely ice, and its workings conformed invariably to certain natural laws. Illuak had said that the ice sheet was a great demon, cruel, greedy, and loath to give up that which it had taken. But such beliefs were crude and primitive superstitions, not to be entertained by enlightened minds of the Pleistocene age. They had climbed the rampart at an early hour of morning. Quanga assured the jewelers that they would reach the cavern by noon at the latest, even if there should be a certain amount of difficulty and delay in locating it. The plain before them was remarkably free of crevasses, and there was little to obstruct their advance. Steering their way with the two breast-shaped mountains for landmarks before them, they came after three hours to a hill-like elevation that corresponded to the mound of Illawak's story. With little trouble, they found the opening of the deep chamber. It seemed that the place had changed little if at all since the visit of Illawak, for the interior, with its columns and pendant icicles, conformed closely to his description. The entrance was like a fanged moor. Within, the floor sloped downward at a slippery angle for more than a hundred feet. The chamber swam with a cold and glaucous translucency that filtered through the dome-like roof. At the lower end, in the striated wall, Quanger and the jewelers saw the embedded shapes of a number of men, among which they distinguished easily the tall, blue-clad corpse of King Haller and the dark, bowed mummy of Omum Vogue. Behind these, the shapes of others lifting their serried spears eternally and receding downward in stiff ranks through unfathomable depths were faintly discernible. Haller stood regal and erect, with wide-open eyes that stared haughtily as in life. Upon his bosom the triangle of hot and blood-bright ruby smoldered unquenchably in the glacial gloom, and the colder eyes of topazes, of beryls, of diamonds, of chrysolites gleamed and twinkled from his azure raiment. It seemed that the fabulous gems were separated by no more than a foot or two of ice from the greedy fingers of the hunter and his companions. Without speaking, they stared raptly at the far-sought treasure. Apart from the great rubies, the jewelers were also estimating the value of the other gems worn by Haller. These alone, they thought complacently, would have made it worthwhile to endure the fatigue of the journey and the insolence of Quanga. The hunter, on his part, was wishing that he had driven an even steeper bargain. The two bags of gold, however, would make him a wealthy man. He could drink to his full content the costly wines, redder than the rubies, that came from far as Ulderum in the south. The tawny, slant-eyed girls of Iqua would dance at his bidding, and he could gamble for high stakes. All three were unmindful of the eeriness of their situation, alone in that boreal solitude with the frozen dead, and they were oblivious likewise to the ghoulish nature of the robbery they were about to commit. Without waiting to be urged by his companions, Quanga raised the keen and highly-tempered pick of bronze and began to assail the translucent wall with mighty blows. The ice rang shrilly beneath the pick, and dropped away in crystal splinters and diamond lumps. In a few minutes he had made a large cavity, and only a thin shell, cracked and shattering, remained before the body of Haller. This shell Quanga proceeded to pry off with great care, and soon the triangle of monstrous rubies, more or less encrusted still with clinging ice, lay bare to his fingers. While the proud, bleak eyes of Haller stared immovably upon him from behind their glassy mask, the hunter dropped the pick, and drawing his sharp, leaf-shaped sword from its scabbard, he began to sever the fine silver wires by which the rubies were attached cunningly to the king's raiment. In his haste, he ripped away portions of the sea-blue fabric, 
bearing the frozen and dead white flesh beneath. One by one, as he removed the rubies, he gave them to whom Phethos, standing close behind him, and the dealer, bright-eyed with avarice, drooling a little with ecstasy, stored them carefully in a huge pouch of mottled lizard skin that he had brought along for the purpose. The last ruby had been secured, and Quanga was about to turn his attention to the lesser jewels that adorned the king's garments in curious patterns and signs of astrological or hieratic significance. Then, amid their preoccupation, he and whom Phethos were startled by a loud and splintering crash that ended with myriad tinklings as of broken glass. Turning, they saw that a huge icicle had fallen from the cavern dome, and its point, as if aimed unerringly, had cloven the skull of Ibis Santh, who lay amid the debris of shattered ice with the sharp end of the fragment deeply embedded in his oozing brain. He had died instantly, without knowledge of his doom. The accident, it seemed, was a perfectly natural one, such as might occur in summer from a slight melting of the immense pendant. But amid their consternation, Quanger and Humphethos were compelled to take note of certain circumstances that were far from normal or explicable. During the removal of the rubies, on which their attention had been centred so exclusively, the chamber had narrowed to half of its former width, and had also closed down from above, till the hanging icicles were almost upon them, like the champing teeth of some tremendous mouth. The place had darkened, and the light was such as might filter into arctic seas beneath heavy flows. The incline of the cave had grown steeper, as if it were pitching into bottomless depths. Far up, incredibly far, the two men beheld the tiny entrance, which seemed no bigger than the mouth of a fox's hole. For an instant, they were stupefied. The changes of the cavern could admit of no natural explanation, and the Hyperboreans felt the clammy surge of all the superstitious terrors that they had formerly disclaimed. No longer could they deny the conscious, animate malevolence, the diabolic powers of Baal imputed to the ice in old legends. Realizing their peril, and spurred by a wild panic, they started to climb the incline. Whom Phethos retained the bulging pouch of rubies, as well as the heavy bag of gold coins that hung from his girdle, and Quanga had enough presence of mind to keep his sword and pickaxe. In their terror-driven haste, however, both forgot the second bag of gold, which lay beside Ibersanth, under the debris of the shattered pendant. The supernatural narrowing of the cave, the dreadful and sinister closing down of its roof, had apparently ceased. At any rate, the Hyperboreans could detect no visible continuation of the process as they climbed frantically and precariously toward the opening. They were forced to stoop in many places, to avoid the mighty fangs that threatened to descend upon them, and even with the rough tiger-skin buskins that they wore, it was hard to keep their footing on the terrible slope. Sometimes they pulled themselves up by means of the slippery, pillar-like formations, and often Quanga, who led the way, was compelled to hew hasty steps in the incline with his pick. Whom Phethos was too terrified for even the most rudimentary reflection. But Quanga, as he climbed, was considering the monstrous alterations of the cave, which he could not align with his wide and various experience of the phenomena of nature. He tried to convince himself that he had made a singular error in estimating the chamber's dimensions and the inclination of its floor. The effort was useless. He still found himself confronted by a thing that outraged his reason, a thing that distorted the known face of the world with unearthly, hideous madness, and mingled a malign chaos with its ordered workings. After an ascent that was frightfully prolonged, like the effort to escape from some delirious, tedious nightmare predicament, they neared the cavern mouth. There was barely room now for a man to creep on his belly beneath the sharp and ponderous teeth. Quanger, 
feeling that the fangs might close upon him like those of some great monster, hurled himself forward and started to wriggle through the opening with a most unheroic celerity. Something held him back, and he thought, for one moment of stark horror, that his worst apprehensions were being realized. Then he found that his bow and quiver of arrows, which he had forgotten to remove from his shoulders, were caught against the pendant ice. While whom Phethos gibbered in a frenzy of fear and impatience, he crawled back and relieved himself of the impeding weapons, which he thrust before him together with his pick in a second and more successful attempt to pass through the straight opening. Rising to his feet on the open glacier, he heard a wild cry from whom Phethos, who, trying to follow Quanga, had become tightly wedged in the entrance through his greater girth. His right hand, clutching the pouch of rubies, was thrust forward beyond the threshold of the cave. He howled incessantly, with half-coherent protestations that the cruel ice teeth were crushing him to death. In spite of the eerie terrors that had unmanned him, the hunter still retained enough courage to go back and try to assist Humphethos. He was about to assail the huge icicles with his pick, when he heard an agonizing scream from the jeweler, followed by a harsh and indescribable grating. There had been no visible movement of the fangs, and yet Quanga now saw that they had reached the cavern floor. The body of whom Phethos, pierced through and through by one of the icicles and ground down by the blunted teeth, was spurting blood on the glacier, like the red mist from a wine press. Quanga doubted the very testimony of his senses. The thing before him was patently impossible. There was no mark of cleavage in the mound above the cavern mouth to explain the descent of those awful fangs. Before his very eyes, but too swiftly for direct cognition, this unthinkable enormity had occurred. Whom Phethos was beyond all earthly help, and Quanga, now wholly the slave of a hideous panic, would hardly have stayed longer to assist him in any case. But seeing the pouch that had fallen forward from the dead jeweler's fingers, the hunter snatched it up through an impulse of terror-mingled greed, and then, with no backward glance, he fled on the glacier, toward the low circling sun. For a few moments, as he ran, Quanga failed to perceive the sinister and ill-boding alterations, comparable to those of the cave, which had somehow occurred in the sheeted plain itself. With a terrific shock, which became an actual vertigo, he saw that he was climbing a long, insanely tilted slope, above whose remote extreme the sun had receded strangely, and was now small and chill, as if seen from an outer planet. The very sky was different. Though still perfectly cloudless, it had taken on a curious deathly pallor. A brooding sense of inimical volition, a vast and freezing malignity, seemed to pervade the air and to settle upon Quanga like an incubus. But more terrifying than all else, in its proof of a conscious and maligned arrangement of natural law, was the giddy poleward inclination that had been assumed by the level plateau. Quanga felt that creation itself had gone mad, and had left him at the mercy of demoniacal forces from the godless outer gulfs. Keeping a perilous foothold, weaving and staggering laboriously upward, he feared momently that he would slip and fall and slide back forever into arctic depths unfathomable. And yet, when he dared to pause at last, and turn shudderingly to peer down at the supposed descent, he saw behind him an acclivity similar in all respects to the one he was climbing, a mad, oblique wall of ice that rose interminably to a second, remote sun. In the confusion of that strange boule versement, he seemed to lose the last remnant of equilibrium, and the glacier reeled and pitched about him like an overturning world, as he strove to recover the sense of direction that had never before deserted him. Everywhere it appeared, there were small and one parhelia that mocked him above unending glacial scarps. He resumed his hopeless climb through a topsy-turvy world of illusion, whether north, south, east, or west, 
He could not tell. A sudden wind swept downward on the glacier. It shrieked in Quanga's ears like the myriad voices of taunting devils. It moaned and laughed and ululated with shrill notes as of crackling ice. It seemed to pluck at Quanga with live, malicious fingers, to suck the breath for which he fought agonizingly. In spite of his heavy raiment and the speed of his toilsome ascent, he felt its bitter, mordant teeth searching and biting even to the marrow. Dimly, as he continued to climb upward, he saw that the ice was no longer smooth, but had risen into pillars and pyramids around him, or was fretted obscenely into wilder shapes. Immense, malignant profiles leered in blue-green crystal. The malformed heads of bestial devils frowned, and rearing dragons writhed immovably along the scarp or sank frozen into deep crevasses. Apart from these imaginary forms that were assumed by the ice itself, Quanga saw, or believed that he saw, human bodies and faces embedded in the glacier. Pale hands appeared to reach dimly and imploringly toward him from the depths, and he felt upon him the frost-bound eyes of men who had been lost in former years, and beheld their sunken limbs grown rigid in strange attitudes of torture. Quanga was no longer capable of thought. Deaf, blind, primordial terrors older than reason had filled his mind with their atavistic darkness. They drove him on implacably, as a beast is driven, and would not let him pause or flag on the mocking nightmare slope. Reflection would have told him only that his ultimate escape was impossible, that the ice, alive and conscious and maleficent thing, was merely playing a cruel and fantastic game, which it had somehow devised in its incredible animism. So perhaps it was well that he had lost the power of reflection. Beyond hope and without warning, he came to the end of the glaciation. It was like the sudden shift of a dream, which takes the dreamer unaware, and he stared uncomprehendingly for some moments at the familiar Hyperborean valleys below the rampart, to the south, and the volcanoes that fumed darkly beyond the southeastern hills. His flight from the cavern had consumed almost the whole of the long subpolar afternoon, and the sun was now swinging close above the horizon. The Parhelia had vanished, and the ice sheet, as if by some prodigious ledger domain, had resumed its normal horizontality. If he had been able to compare his impressions, Quanga would have realized that at no time had he surprised the glacier in the accomplishment of its bewildering supernatural changes. Doubtfully, as if it were a mirage that might fade at any moment, he surveyed the landscape below the battlements. To all appearances, he had returned to the very place from which he and the jewelers had begun their disastrous journey on the ice. Before him, an easy declivity, fretted and runnelled, ran down toward the grassy meadows. Fearing that it was all deceitful and unreal, a fair beguiling trap, a new treachery of the element that he had grown to regard as a cruel and almighty demon, Quanga descended the slope with hasty leaps and bounds. Even when he stood ankle-deep in the great club mosses, with leafy willows and sedgy grasses about him, he could not quite believe in the verity of his escape. The mindless prompting of a panic fear still drove him on, and a primal instinct, equally mindless, drew him toward the volcanic peaks. The instinct told him that he would find refuge from the bitter boreal cold amid their purlieus, and if there, if anywhere, he would be safe from the diabolical machinations of the glacier. Boiling springs were said to flow perpetually from the nether slopes of these mountains. Great geysers, roaring and hissing like infernal cauldrons, filled the higher gullies with scalding cataracts. The long snows that swept upon Hyperborea were turned to mild rains in the vicinity of the volcanoes, and there a rich and sultry-coloured flora, formerly native to the whole region but now exotic, flourished throughout the seasons. Quanga could not find the little shaggy horses that he and his companions had left tethered to the dwarf willows and the valley meadow. Perhaps, after all, it was 
not the same valley. At any rate, he did not stay his flight to search for them. Without delay or lingering, after one fearful backward look at the menacing mass of the glaciation, he started off in a direct line for the smoke-plumed mountains. The sun sank lower, skirting endlessly the southwestern horizon, and flooding the battlemented ice and the rolling landscape with a light of pale amethyst. Quanger, with iron thews inured to protracted marches, pressed on in his unremitting terror, and was overtaken gradually by the long, ethereal-tinted twilight of northern summer. Somehow, through all the stages of his flight, he had retained the pickaxe, as well as his bow and arrows. Automatically, hours before, he had placed the heavy pouch of rubies in the bosom of his raiment for safekeeping. He had forgotten them, and he did not even notice the trickle of water from the melting of crusted ice about the jewels that seeped upon his flesh from the lizard-skin pouch. Crossing one of the innumerable valleys, he stumbled against a protruding willow root, and the pick was hurled from his fingers as he fell. Rising to his feet, he ran on without stopping to retrieve it. A ruddy glow from the volcanoes was now visible on the darkening sky. It brightened as Quanga went on, and he felt that he was nearing the far-sought, inviolable sanctuary. Though still thoroughly shaken and demoralized by his preterhuman ordeals, he began to think that he might escape from the ice demon after all. Suddenly, he became aware of a consuming thirst, to which he had been oblivious heretofore. Daring to pause in one of the shallow valleys, he drank from a blossom-bordered stream. Then, beneath the crushing load of an unconsciously accumulated fatigue, he flung himself down to rest for a little while, among the blood-red poppies that were purple with twilight. Sleep fell like a soft and overwhelming snow upon his eyelids, but was soon broken by evil dreams, in which he still fled vainly from the mocking and inexorable glacier. He awoke in a cold horror, sweating and shivering, and found himself staring at the northern sky, where a delicate flush was dying slowly. It seemed to him that a great shadow, malign and massive and somehow solid, was moving upon the horizon and striding over the low hills toward the valley in which he lay. It came with inexpressible speed, and the last light appeared to fall from the heavens, chill as a reflection caught in ice. He started to his feet, with the stiffness of prolonged exhaustion in all his body, and the nightmare stupefaction of slumber still mingling with his half-awakened fears. In this state, with a mad momentary defiance, he unslung his bow and discharged arrow after arrow, emptying his quiver at the huge and bleak and formless shadow that seemed to impend before him on the sky. Having done this, he resumed his headlong flight. Even as he ran, he shivered uncontrollably with the sudden and intense cold that had filled the valley. Vaguely, with an access of fear, he felt that there was something unwholesome and unnatural about the cold, something that did not belong to the place or the season. The glowing volcanoes were quite near, and soon he would reach their outlying hills. The air about him should be temperate, even if not actually warm. All at once, the air darkened before him, with a sourceless blue-green glimmering in its depths. For a moment, he saw the featureless shadow that rose gigantically upon his path, and obscured the very stars and the glare of the volcanoes. Then, with the swirling of a tempest-driven vapor, it closed about him, gelid and relentless. It was like phantom ice, a thing that blinded his eyes and stifled his breath, as if he were buried in some glacial tomb. It was cold with a transarctic rigor, such as he had never known, that ached unbearably in all his flesh, and was followed by a swiftly spreading numbness. Dimly, he heard a sound as of clashing icicles, a grinding as of heavy flows, and the blue-green gloom that tightened and thickened around him. It was as if the soul of the glacier, malign and implacable, had overtaken him in his flight. 
At times he struggled numbly, in half-drowsy terror, with some obscure impulse, as if to propitiate a vengeful deity. He took the pouch of rubies from his bosom with prolonged and painful effort, and tried to hurl it away. The thongs that tied the pouch were loosened by its fall, and Quanga heard faintly, as if from a great distance, the tinkle of the rubies as they rolled and scattered on some hard surface. Then oblivion deepened about him, and he fell forward stiffly, without knowing that he had fallen. Morning found him beside the little stream, stark frozen, and lying on his face in a circle of poppies that had been blackened as if by the footprint of some gigantic demon of frost. A nearby pool, formed by the leisurely rill, was covered with thin ice, and on the ice, like gouts of frozen blood, there lay the scattered rubies of Halle. In its own time, the great glacier, moving slowly and irresistibly southward, would reclaim them. The Moonstone Mass by Harriet Prescott Spofford There was a certain weakness possessed by my ancestors, though in no wise peculiar to them, and of which, in common with other more or less undesirable traits, I have come into the inheritance. It was the fear of dying in poverty. That, too, in the face of a goodly share of pelf stored in stocks— and lands, and copper-bottomed clippers, or what stood for copper-bottomed clippers, or rather sailed for them, in the clumsy commerce of their times. There was one old fellow in particular, his portrait is hanging over the hall-stove today, leaning forward, somewhat blistered by the profuse heat and wasted fuel there, and as if as long as such an outrageous expenditure of caloric was going on, he meant to have the full benefit of it, who is said to have frequently shed tears over the probable price of his dinner, and on the next day to have sent home a silver dish to eat it from at a hundred times the cost. Ah, I find the inconsistencies of this individual constantly cropping out in myself, and although I could by no possibility be called a niggard, yet I confess that even now my prodigalities make me shiver. Some years ago I was the proprietor of the old family estate— unencumbered by anything except timber, that is worth its weight in gold yet, as you might say, alone in the world, save for an unloved relative, and with a sufficiently comfortable income, as I have since discovered, to meet all reasonable wants. I had, moreover, promised me in marriage the hand of a woman without a peer, and which I believe now might have been mine on any day when I saw fit to claim it. That I loved Eleanor tenderly and truly, you cannot doubt. That I desired to bring her home, to see her flitting here and there in my dark old house, illuminating it with her youth and beauty, sitting at the head of my table that sparkled with its gold and silver heirlooms, making my days and nights like one delightful dream, was just as true. And yet I hesitated. I looked over my bank book. I cast up my accounts— I have enough for one, I said. I am not sure that it is enough for two. Eleanor, daintily nurtured, requires as dainty care for all time to come. Moreover, it is not too alone to be considered, for should children come, there is their education, their maintenance, their future provision and portion to be found. All this would impoverish us, and unless we ended by becoming mere dependents, we had, to my excited vision, only the cold charity of the world and the workhouse to which to look forward. I do not believe that Eleanor thought me right in so much of the matter as I saw fit to explain. But in maiden pride, her lips perforce were sealed. She laughed, though, when I confessed my workhouse fear, and said that for her part she was thankful there was such a refuge at all, 
standing as it did on its knoll in the midst of green fields and shaded by broad-limbed oaks. She had always envied the old women sitting there by their evening fireside, and mumbling over their small affairs to one another. But all her words seemed merely idle badinage, so I delayed. I said, when the ship sails in, when that dividend is declared, when I see how this speculation turns out. The days were long that added up the count of years. The nights were dreary. But I believed that I was actuated by principle, and took pride to myself for my strength and self-denial. Moreover, old Paul, my great-uncle on my mother's side, and the millionaire of the family, was a bitter misogynist, and regarded women and marriage and household cares as the three remediless mistakes of an overruling providence. He knew of my engagement to Eleanor, but so long as it remained in that stage he had nothing to say. Let me once marry, and my share of his million would be best represented by a cipher. However, he was not a man to adore, and he could not live forever. Still, with all my own effort, I amassed wealth, but slowly, according to my standard. My various ventures had various luck— and one day my old uncle Paul, always intensely interested in the subject, both scientifically and from a commercial point of view, too old and feeble to go himself, but fain to send a proxy, and desirous of money in the family, made me an offer of that portion of his wealth on my return, which would be mine on his demise, funded safely subject to my order, provided I made one of those who sought the discovery of the Northwest Passage." I went to town, canvassed the matter with the experts. I had always an adventurous streak, as old Paul well knew, and having given many hours to the pursuit of the smaller sciences, had a turn for danger and discovery as well. And when the albatross sailed, in spite of Eleanor's shivering remonstrance and prayers and tears, in spite of the grave looks of my friends, I was one of those that clustered on her deck, prepared for either fate. They, my companions, it is true, were led by nobler lights. But as for me, it was much as I told Eleanor. My affairs were so regulated that they would go on uninterruptedly in my absence. I should be no worse off for going, and if I returned, letting alone the renown of the thing, my Uncle Paul's donation was to be appropriated. Everything then was assured, and we stood possessed of lucky lives." If I had any keen or eager desire of search, any purpose to aid the growth of the world or to penetrate the secrets of its formation, as indeed I think I must have had, I did not at that time know anything about it. But I was to learn that death and stillness have no kingdom on this globe, and that even in the extremest bitterness of cold and ice, perpetual interchange and motion is taking place. So we went, all sails set on favourable winds, bounding over blue sea, skirting frowning coasts, and ever pushing our way up into the dark mystery of the north. I shall not delay here to tell of Danish posts and the hospitality of summer settlements in their long afternoon of Arctic daylight, nor will I weary you with any description of the succulence of the radishes that grew under the panes of glass— in the governor's scrap of moss and soil, scarcely of more size than a lady's parlour fernery, and which seemed to our dry mouths full of all the earth's cool juices. But advance, as we ourselves hastened to do, while that chill and crystalline sun shone up into the ice-cased dens and caverns of the pole. By the time that the long blue twilight fell, when the rough and rasping cold sheathed all the atmosphere— and the great stars pricked themselves out on the heavens like spears' points. The albatross was hauled up for winter quarters, banked and boarded, heaved high on fields of ice, and all her inmates, during the wintry dark, led the life that prepared them for further exploits in higher latitudes the coming year, learning the dialects of the Eskimo, the tricks of the seal and walrus, making long explorations with the dogs and Glipnu, their master breaking ourselves in for business that had no play about it. Then, at last, the August sun set us free again. Inlets of tumultuous water traversed the great ice-flows. 
The albatross, refitted, ruffled all her plumage and spread her wings once more for the north, for the secret that sat there domineering all its substance. It was a year since we had heard from home, but who stayed to think of that while our keel spurned into foam the sheets of steely seas, and day by day brought us nearer to the hidden things we sought? For myself, I confess that, now so close to the end as it seemed, curiosity and research absorbed every other faculty. Eleanor might be mouldering back to the parent earth. I could not stay to meditate on such a possibility. My Uncle Paul's donation might enrich itself with gold dust, instead of the gathered dust of idle days. It, it was nothing to me. I had but one thought, one ambition, one desire in those days, the discovery of the clear seas and open passage. I endured all our hardships as if they had been luxuries. I made light of scurvy, banqueted off train oil, and met that cold for which there is no language framed, and which might be a new element, or which rather had seemed in that long night like the vast void of ether beyond the uttermost star, where was neither air nor light nor heat, but only bitter negation and emptiness. I was hardly conscious of my body. I was only a concentrated search in myself. The recent explorers had announced here, in the neighbourhood of where our third summer at last found us, the existence of an immense space of clear water. One even declared that he had seen it. My Uncle Paul had pronounced the declaration false, and the sight an impossibility. The North he believed to be the breeder of icebergs, an ever-welling fountain of cold. The great glaciers there forever form, forever fall. The ice packs line the gorges from year to year unchanging. Peaks of volcanic rock drop their frozen mantles like a scale, only to display the fresher one beneath. The whole region, said he, is plutonic, blasted by a primordial convulsion of the great forces of creation. And though it may be a few miles nearer to the central fires of the earth, allowing that there are such things, yet that would not in itself detract from the frigid power of its sunless solitudes. The more especially when it is remembered that the spinning of the earth, while in its first plastic material, which gave it greater circumference and thinness of shell at its equator, must have thickened the shell correspondingly at the poles, and the character of all the waste and wilderness there only signifies the impenetrable wall between its surface and centre, through which wall no heat could enter or escape. The great rivers, like the White and the Mackenzie, emptying to the north of the continents, so far from being enough in themselves to form any body of ever fresh and flowing water, can only pierce the opposing ice fields in narrow streams and bays and inlets as they seek the Atlantic and the Pacific seas. And as for the theory of the currents of water heated in the tropics and carried by the rotary motion of the planet to the pole, where they rise and melt the ice flows into this great suppositious sea. It is simply an absurdity on the face of it, he argued, when you remember that, warm water being in its nature specifically lighter than cold, it would have risen to the surface long before it reached there. No, thought my Uncle Paul, who took nothing for granted. It is, as I said, an absurdity on the face of it. My nephew shall prove it and I stake half the earnings of my life upon it. To tell the truth, I thought much the same as he did, and now that such a mere trifle of distance intervened between me and the proof, I was full of a feverish impatience that almost amounted to insanity. We had proceeded but a few days, coasting the crushing capes of rock that everywhere seemed to run out in a diablery of tusks and horns to drivers from the region that they warded, now cruising through a runlet of blue water just wide enough for our keel, with silver reaches of frost stretching away into a ghastly horizon, now plunging upon tossing seas, the sun wheeling round and round, and never sinking from the strange, weird sky above us, when again to our lookout a glimmer in the low horizon told its awful tale— a sort of smoky luster like that which might ascend from an army of spirits, 
The fierce and fatal spirits tented on the terrible field of the ice flow. We were alone, a single little ship speeding ever upward in the midst of that untraveled desolation. We spoke seldom to one another, oppressed with the sense of our situation. It was a loneliness that seemed more than a death in life, a solitude that was supernatural. Here and now it was clear water. Ten hours later, and we were caught in the teeth of the cold, wedged in the ice that had advanced upon us and surrounded us, fettered by another winter in latitudes where human life had never before been supported. We found, before the hands of the dial had taught us the lapse of a week, that this would be something not to be endured. The sun sank lower every day behind the crags and silvery horns. The heavens grew to wear a hue of violet, almost black, and yet unbearably dazzling. As the notes of our voices fell upon the atmosphere, they assumed a metallic tone, as if the air itself had become frozen from the beginning of the world, and they tinkled against it. Our sufferings had mounted in their intensity till they were too great to be resisted. It was decided at length when the one long day had given place to its answering night, and in the jet-black heavens the stars, like knobs of silver, sparkled so large and close upon us that we might have grasped them in our hands, that I should take a sledge with Glipnu and his dogs, and see if there were any path to the westward by which, if the albatross were forsaken, those of her crew that remained might follow it, and find an escape to safety. Our path was on a frozen sea— if we discovered land, we did not know that the foot of man had ever trodden it. We could hope to find no cache of snow-buried food. Neither fish nor game lived in this desert of ice that was so devoid of life in any shape as to seem dead itself. But, well provisioned, furred to the eyes, and essaying to nurse some hopefulness of heart, we set out on our way through this valley of death, relieving one another, and travelling day and night. Still night and day to the west rose the black coast, one interminable height. To the east extended the sheets of unbroken ice. Sometimes a huge glacier hung pendulous from the precipice. Once we saw, by the starlight, a white, foaming, rushing river arrested and transformed to ice in its flight down that steep. A south wind began to blow behind us. We travelled on the ice— Three days, perhaps, as days are measured among men, had passed, when we found that we made double progress, for the ice travelled too. The whole field, carried by some northward-bearing current, was afloat. It began to be crossed and cut by a thousand crevasses. The cakes, an acre each, tilted up and down, and made wide waves with their ponderous plashing in the black body of the sea. We could hear them grinding distantly in the clear dark against the coast, against each other. There was no retreat. There was no advance. We were on the ice, and the ice was breaking up. Suddenly, we rounded a tongue of the primeval rock, and recoiled before a narrow gulf. One sharp shadow, as deep as despair, was full of aguish fears. It was just wide enough for the sledge to span. Glipnu made the dogs leap. We could be no worse off if they drowned. They touched the opposite block. It careened. It went under. The sledge went with it. I was left alone where I had stood. Two dogs broke loose and scrambled up beside me. Glipnu and the others I never saw again. I sank upon the ice. The dogs crouched beside me. Sometimes I think they saved my brain from total ruin— for without them I could not have withstood the enormity of that loneliness, a loneliness that it was impossible should be broken, floating on and on with that vast journeying company of spectral ice. I had food enough to support life for several days to come, in the pouch at my belt. The dogs and I shared it, for last as long as it would, when it should be gone, there was only death before us, no reprieve. Sooner or later that, as well sooner as later— the living terrors of this icy hell were all about us, and death could be no worse. Still the south wind blew. The rapid current carried us. The dark skies grew deep and darker. 
The lanes and avenues between the stars were crowded with forebodings, for the air seemed full of a new power, a strange and invisible influence, as if a king of unknown terrors here held his awful state. Sometimes the dogs stood up and growled and bristled their shaggy hides. I, prostrate on the ice, and all my frame was stung with a universal tingle. I was no longer myself. At this moment my blood seemed to sing and bubble in my veins. I grew giddy with a sort of delirious and inexplicable ecstasy. With another moment unutterable horror seized me. I was plunged and weighed down with a black and suffocating load, while evil things seemed to flap their wings in my face, to breathe in my mouth, to draw my soul out of my body and carry it careering through the frozen realm of that murky heaven, to restore it with a shock of agony. Once, as I lay there, still floating, floating northward, out of the dim dark rim of the water world, a lance of piercing light shot up the zenith. It divided the heavens like a knife. They opened out in one blaze, and the fire fell sheetingly down before my face. Cold fire, curdlingly cold, light robbed of heat, and set free in a preternatural anarchy of the elements. Its fringes swung to and fro before my face, pricked it with flaming spicule, dissolving in a thousand colors that spread everywhere over the low field, flashing, flickering, creeping, reflecting, and gathering again in one long serpentine line of glory that wavered in slow convolutions across the cuts and crevasses of the ice, wreathed ever nearer, and, lifting its head at last, became nothing in the darkness but two great eyes like glowing coals, with which it stared me to astound, till I threw myself face down to hide me in the ice, and the whining, bristling dogs cowered backward, and were dead. I should have supposed myself to be in the region of the magnetic pole of the sphere, if I did not know that I had long since left it behind me. My pocket compass had become entirely useless, and every scrap of metal that I had about me had become a lodestone. The very ice, as if it were congealed from water that held large quantities of iron in solution, iron escaping from whatever solid land there was beneath or around, the plutonic rock that such a region could have alone veined and seamed with metal. The very ice appeared to have a magnetic quality. It held me so that I changed my position upon it with difficulty, and, as if it established a battery by the aid of the singular atmosphere above it, frequently sent thrills quivering through and through me, till my flesh seemed about to resolve into all the jarring atoms of its original constitution, and again soothed me, with a velvet touch, into a state which, if it were not sleep, was at least haunted by visions that I dare not believe to have been realities, and from which I always awoke with a start to find myself still floating, floating. My watch had long since ceased to beat. I felt an odd persuasion that I had died when that stood still, and only this slavery of the magnet, of the cold, this power that locked everything in invisible fetters and let nothing loose again, held my soul still in the bonds of my body. Another idea also took possession of me, for my mind was open to whatever visitant chose to enter, since utter despair of safety or release had left it vacant of a hope or fear. These enormous days and nights, swinging in their arc six months long, with a pendulum that dealt time in another measure than that dealt by the sunlight of lower zones. They told the time of what interminable years, the years of what vast generations far beyond the span that covered the age of the primeval men of Scripture. They measured time on this gigantic and enduring scale for what wonderful and mighty beings, old as the everlasting hills, as destitute as they of mortal sympathy, cold and inscrutable, handling the two-edged javelins of frost and magnetism, and served by all the unknown polar agencies. I fancied that I 
saw their far-reaching cohorts marshalling and manoeuvring at times in the field of an horizon that was boundless, the glitter of their spears and casks, the sheen of their white banners, and again, sitting in fearful circle with their phantasmagoria, they shut and hemmed me in and watched me writhe like a worm before them. I had a fancy that the perpetual play of magnetic impulses here gradually disintegrated the expanse of ice, as sunbeams might have done. If it succeeded in unseating me from my cold station, I should drown, and there would be an end of me. It would be all one, for though I clung to life, I did not cling to suffering. Something of the wild beast seemed to spring up in my nature, that ignorance of any moment but the present. I felt a certain kinship to the bear in her comfortable snowiness, whom I'd left in the parallels far below this unreal tract of horrors. I remembered traditions of such metempsychoses. The thought gave me a pang that none of these fierce and subtle elements had known how to give before. But all the time my groaning, cracking ice was moving with me, splitting now through all its leagues of length along the darkness, with an explosion like a cannon shot that echoed again and again in every gap and chasm of its depth, and seemed to be caught up and repeated by a thousand airy sprites, and snatched on from one to another till it fell dead through the frozen thickness of the air. It was at about this time that I noticed another species of motion than that which had hitherto governed it, seizing this journeying ice. It bent and bent, as a glacier does in its viscous flow between mountains. It crowded and loosened, and rent apart, and at last it broke in every direction, and every fragment was crushed and jammed together again, and the whole mass was following, as I divined, the curve of some enormous whirlpool that swept it from beneath. It might have been a day and night, it might have been an hour that we travelled on this vast curve. I had no more means of knowing than if I had veritably done with time. We were one expanse of shadow, not a star above us, only a sky of impenetrable gloom received the shimmering that now and again the circling ice cast off. It was a strange, slow motion, yet with such a steadiness and strength about it that it had the effect of swiftness. It was long since any water, or the suspicion of any, had been visible. We might have been grinding through some gigantic hollow, for all I could have told. Snow had never fallen here. The mass moved, you knew, as if you felt the prodigious hand that grasped and impelled it from beneath. Whither was it tending, in the eddy of what huge stream that went, with the smoke of its fall hovering on the brink, to plunge a tremendous cataract over the limits of the earth and the unknown abyss of space. Far in advance, there was a faint glimmering, a sort of powdery light glancing here and there. As we approached it, the ice and I, it grew fainter, and was, by and by, lost in a vast twilight that surrounded us on all sides. At the same time, it became evident that we had passed under a roof, an immense and vaulted roof, as crowding, stretching, rending, we passed on. Uncanny gleams were playing distantly above us and around us, now and then overlaying all things with a sheeted illumination as deathly as a grave light, now and then shooting up in spires of blood-red radiance that disclosed the terrible aurora. I was in a cavern of ice as wide and as high as the heavens. These flashes of glory— alternated with equal flashes of darkness, as you might say, taught me to perceive. Perhaps tremendous tide after tide had hollowed it with all its fantastic recesses, or had that titanic race of the interminable years built it as a palace for their monarch, a temple for their deity, with its domes that sprung far up immeasurable heights and hung palely shining like mock heavens of hazy stars." its aisles that stretched away down colonnades of crystal columns into unguessed darkness, its high-heaved arches, its pierced and open sides. Now, 
an aurora burned up like a blue light, and went skimming under all the vaults far off into far and farther hollows, revealing as it went still loftier heights and colder answering radiances. Then these great arches glowed like blocks of beryl, wondrous tracery of delicate vines and leaves, greener than the greenest moss, wandered over them, wreathed the great pillars, and spread round them in capitals of flowers, roses crimson as a carbuncle, hyacinths like bedded cubes of amethyst, violets bluer than sapphires, all as if the flowers had been turned to flame, yet all so cruelly cold, as if the power that wrought such wonders could simulate a sparkle beyond even the luster of light, but could not give it heat, that principle of life, that fountain of first being. Yonder a stalactite of clustered ruby, that kept the aurora and glinted faintly and more faintly, till the thing came again when it grasped a whole body full of splendor, hung downward and dropped a thread-like stem and a blossom of palest pink, like a transfigured linear, to meet the snowdrop in its sheath of green that shot up from a spire of aquamarine below. Here, living rainbows flew from buttress to buttress and frolicked in the domes. The only things that dared to live and sport were beauty was frozen into horror. It seemed as if that shifting death-light of the aurora photographed all these things upon my memory, for I noted none of them at the time. I only wondered idly whether we were tending, as we drove in deeper and deeper under that ice roof, and curved more and more circlingly upon our course, while the silent flashes sped on overhead. Now we were in the dark again, crashing onward, now a cold blue radiance burst from every icicle, from every crevice, and I saw that the whole enormous mass of our motion bent and swept around a single point, a dark yet glittering form that sat as if upon the apex of the world. Was it one of those mightier than the Anakim, more than the sons of God, to whom all the currents of this frozen world converged? Sooth I know not. For presently I imagine that my vision made only an exaggeration of some brown Eskimo sealed up and left in his snow-house to die. A thin sheathing of ice appeared to clothe him and give the glister to his duskiness. Insensible as I had thought myself to any further fear, I cowered beneath the stare of those dead and icy eyes. Slowly we rounded and ever rounded the inside on which my place was, moving less slowly than the outer circle of the sheeted mass in its viscid flow. And as we moved, by some fate, my eye was caught by the substance on which this figure sat. It was no figure at all now, but a bare jag of rock rising in the center of this solid whirlpool, and carrying on its summit something which held a light that not one of these icy freaks pranking in the dress of gems and flowers had found it possible to assume. It was a thing so real, so genuine, my breath became suspended, my heart ceased to beat, my brain that had been a lump of ice seemed to move in its skull, hope that had deserted me suddenly sprung up like a second life within me. The old passion was not dead, if I was. It rose stronger than life or death, or than myself. If I could but snatch that mass of moonstone, that inestimable wealth, it was nothing deceptive, I declared to myself. What more natural home could it have than this region, thrown up here by the old plutonic powers of the planet, as the same substance in smaller shape was thrown up on the peaks of the Mount St. Gotthard, when the Alpine Agui first sprang into the day? There it rested, limpid with its milky pole, casting out flakes of flame and azure, of red and leaf-green light, and holding yet a sparkle of silver in the reflections and refractions of its inner axis, the splendid Turk's eye of the lapidaries, the cousin of the water opal and the girasol, the precious essence of feldspar. Could I break it, I would find clusters of great hematrope crystals, could I obtain it, 
I should have a jewel in that mess of moonstone such as the world never saw. The throne of Jamshid could not cast a shadow beside it. Then, the bitterness of my fate overwhelmed me. Here, with this treasure of a kingdom, this jewel that could not be priced, this wealth beyond an emperor's, and here only to die. My stolid apathy vanished, old thoughts dominated once more, old habits, old desires. I thought of Eleanor then, and her warm, sunny home, the blossoms that bloomed around her, the birds that sang, the cheerful evening fires, the longing thoughts for one who never came, who never was to come. But I would, I cried, where human voice had never cried before, I would return. I would take this treasure with me. I would not be defrauded. Should not I, a man, conquer this inanimate blind matter? I reached out my hands to seize it. Slowly, it receded. Slowly and less slowly. Or was the motion of the ice still carrying me onward? Had we encircled this apex? And were we driving out into the open and uncovered north, and so down the seas and out to the open main of black water again? If so, if I could live through it, I must have this thing. I rose, and as well as I could with my cramped and stiffened limbs, I moved to go back for it. It was useless. The current that carried us was growing invincible. The gaping gulfs of the outer seas were sucking us toward them. I fell. I scrambled to my feet. I would still have gone back, but, as I attempted it, the ice whereon I was inclined ever so slightly, tipped more boldly, gave way and rose in a billow, broke and piled over on another mass beneath. Then the cavern was behind us and I comprehended that this ice stream, having doubled its central point, now in its outward movement encountered the still incoming body, and was to pile above and pass over it, the whole expanse bending, cracking, breaking, crowding and compressing, till its rearing tumult made bergs more mountainous than the offshot glaciers of the Greenland continent, that should ride safely down to crumble in the surging seas below. As block after block of the rent ice rose in the air, lighted by the blue and bristling aurora points, toppled and mounted higher, it seemed to me that now indeed I was battling with those elemental agencies in the dreadful fight I had desired, one man against the might of matter. I sprang from that block to another. I gained my balance on a third, climbing, shouldering, leaping, struggling, holding with my hands, catching with my feet, crawling, stumbling, tottering, rising high and higher with the mountain ever making underneath, a power unknown to my foes coming to my aid, a blessed rushing warmth that glowed on all the surface of my skin, that set the blood to racing in my veins, that made my heart beat with newer hope, sink with newer despair, rise buoyant with new determination. Except when the shaft of light pierced the shivering sky, I could not see or guess the height that I had gained. I was vaguely aware of chasms that were bottomless, of precipices that opened on them, of pinnacles arising round me in aerial spires, when suddenly the shelf on which I must have stood yielded as if it were pushed by great hands, swept down a steep incline like an avalanche, stopped halfway, but sent me flying on, sliding, glancing like a shooting star, down, down the slippery side, breathless, dizzy, smitten with blistering pain by awful winds that whistled by me, far out upon the level ice below that tilted up and down again with a great resonant plash of open water, unconscious for a moment that I lay at last upon a fragment that the mass behind urged on, I knew, and I remembered nothing more. Faces were bending over me when I opened my eyes again, rough, uncouth, and bearded faces, but no monsters of the pole. Whalemen, rather, smelling richly of train oil, 
but I could recall nothing in all my life one fraction so beautiful as they. The angels on whom I hope to open my eyes when death has really taken me will scarcely seem sights more blessed than did those rude whalers of the North Pacific Sea. The North Pacific Sea, for it was there that I was found, explain it how you may. Whether the albatross had pierced farther to the west than her sailing master knew, and had lost her reckoning with the disordered compass needle under new stars, or whether I had really been the sport of the demoniac beings of the ice, tossed by them from zone to zone in a dozen hours. The whalers, real creatures enough, had discovered me on a block of ice, they said. Nor could I, in their opinion, have been many days undergoing my dreadful experience, for there was still food in my wallet when they opened it. They would never believe a word of my story. And so far from regarding me as one who had proved the Northwest Passage in my own person, they considered me a mere idle maniac, as uncomfortable a thing to have on a shipboard as a ghost or a dead body, wrecked and unable to account for myself, and gladly transferred me to a homeward-bound Russian man-of-war, whose officers afforded me more polite but quite as decided scepticism. I have never to this day found any one who believed my story when I told it. So you can take it for what it is worth. Even my uncle Paul flouted it, and absolutely refused to surrender the sum on whose expectation I had taken ship, while my old ancestor, who hung peeling over the whole fire, dropped from his frame in disgust at the idea of one of his hard-cash descendants turning romancer. But all I know— is that the albatross never sailed into port again, and that if I open my knife today and lay it on the table, it will wheel about till the tip of its blade points full at the North Star. I have never found any one to believe me, did I say? Yes, there is one. Eleanor never doubted a word of my narration, never asked me if cold and suffering had not shaken my reason. But then— after the first recital, she has never been willing to hear another word about it. And if I ever allude to my lost treasure, or the possibility of instituting search for it, she asks me if I need more lessons to be content with the treasure that I have, and gathers up her work and gently leaves the room. So that now I speak of it so seldom. If I had not told the thing to you, it might come to pass that I should forget altogether the existence of my mass of moonstone. My mass of moonshine, old Paul calls it. I let him have his say. He cannot have that nor anything else much longer. But when all is done, I recall Galileo, and I mutter to myself, Poor Simwarve, it was a mass of moonstone. With these eyes I saw it. With these hands I touched it. With this heart I longed for it. With this will I mean to have it yet. Prunes by C. P. Howard Journal found in a deserted bothy in the Outer Hebrides April 17 They say that to keep a journal is to keep one's sanity. I do hope that's true. Stationed here, alone, four weeks and counting, and I'm losing my marbles. I'm sorry, Emery. One cannot possibly be alone in your company. Emery, I must add, is my feline companion here at the lighthouse. He's black, black as midnight, property of the corporation. You see, watchmen such as me are no longer permitted to work in pairs or groups. Trouble follows. Folie de they say. Paranoia, mania, but a lone watchman and a corporation cat, huh, that ought to be sufficient. <laughs> we'll see about that, won't we? I've never been much of a diarist. 
I don't really have the aptitude for it. I'm a technician. I observe. Adept analysis doesn't allow for superfluous deviation. But I'll try. Try to put it all down. My thoughts. My feelings. If for no other reason than to pass the time. The dreadful, monotonous time. Again, I'm sorry, Emery, but conversation with you is very one-sided. I'm unable to interpret your incessant purring, calming though it might be. As I said, I've been here for over a month. Arrived March 20. Relieved my predecessor and his cat, and went about the business of applying the personal touches a studious watchman requires. The lighthouse stands on a rocky outcrop, or quay, just half a mile from the island. They say that it has been here for a long time. Centuries? I don't know about that. But the island, I'm hesitant to name it here, has been here for millennia. It projects from the sea like a cluster of cathedral spires, woefully barren and topped with ice. It's the reason I'm here. The reason my predecessors were here, and the cause, no doubt, of the trouble I mentioned earlier. Sitting by the window in the watchroom, which is up on level three, Emery at my feet, fire in the stove, the island ogles me with shimmering, hostile eyes. If it wasn't for the money, I wouldn't be here. But the money is good, very good. It has to be, all things considered. Still... I'd rather not be here. I miss the warmth of the sun, and the cafes along the promenade. I'm a people-watcher at heart, observing the comings and goings of strangers as they order a cappuccino and read a book, or gaze longingly at the sapphire waters. The latter I can do, at least. The ocean is all about me, a vast desert, flat and expansive. Astonishing, really. April 19. Cats are sensitive creatures. It was the marked change in Emery's behavior that alerted me to the onset of the blizzard last night. We were in the watch room, some fifty meters above the waters below, when suddenly my feline companion approached me, and proceeded to brush up against me fitfully. A distant wail followed, accompanied by the unmistakable but initially sporadic pitter-patter of hailstones against the north window. The storm proper wasn't far behind, bearing down on the lighthouse with great rapidity. Emery became quite twitchy, emitting a low yowl, trotting back and forth by my feet, demanding attention. This I gave him, as the hail, robust and pitiless, continued its assault. The invisible wind howled ceaselessly, not to be hindered by the minuscule lighthouse in its path. We hunkered down, Emery and I, my gaze fixed on the north window, praying to God that the thick glass would remain intact. Eventually my prayers were answered. The blizzard passed over us and left us in peace, fading like a whirling wraith in the southern gloom. The night sky thereafter cleared, revealing the sparkling stars in all their glory. The aurora borealis danced a dim waltz, sage green and crimson red. But little comfort did these things provide, for the clearing of the skies could lead to only one thing, a drop in temperature. And the drop was dramatic. On waking this morning, the temperature outside had plummeted to minus twenty degrees Celsius, and now the key is surrounded by a circle of ice a circle that is expanding hour by hour. This troubles me greatly, for the waters between the lighthouse and the island are exceedingly calm. If the water continues to freeze... April 20 In spite of my fears, the routine continues. Rise at dawn, feed the fire, feed Emery, feed myself. Survey the light. Firewood is plentiful, but limited, so I burn it sparingly. I'm here till June 20, so I must eat sparingly, too. The lower of the two stores, the stores being at ground level and level one, respectively, contains fuel for the light. This 
hefty supply, I'm told, is enough to power the light for a decade. But my primary duty is that of the watch. We watch the island, but we don't ask questions. Those who ask questions are not qualified for the watch. It's that simple. We're paid to take care of the lighthouse and to keep our eyes on that strange atoll. We speculate, privately nowadays, knowing the fates of our predecessors, our conjecture stemming from hushed exchanges over foaming ales in seafront bars. Former watchmen speak of shadows and spectres, piping and moans, bright lights and thunderous booms, all confined to the island. These observations are to be recorded minutely, later handed over to the corporation for further study. I've seen neither hide nor hair of such things myself, heard only the faint whistle of the northerly wind as it blows through the tallest crags of that barren rock. Eerie though it is, I'm continually reassured by the stable disposition of my feline companion. Emery will know before I, if strangeness is abroad. The circle of ice surrounding the quay continues to grow. To the north there's the suggestion now of a white pathway, a bridge of ice forming between the lighthouse and the island. Tomorrow morning I'll brave the terrible cold and test the integrity of that ice. April 21 Lunchtime. Emery and I are in the watchroom, filling our bellies. My feline companion purrs contentedly, which pleases me. As for my activities earlier this morning, I donned my furs and went out at about ten a.m. It was appallingly cold. The steep descent to the circle of ice below would have been treacherous in anything less than snow boots. Numerous pokes and prods assured me that the water was indeed frozen solid. The bridge of ice I mentioned, which leads directly to the island, is surely traversable. This fact bothers me tremendously, for it has been speculated that some of my predecessors never returned from their watches. Some, it is said, were simply absent from their posts when their successors came to relieve them. Watchers, or the watched. I could head over there, I suppose, traverse that white pathway and look for evidence of foul play. No, not a snowflake's chance in hell. My primary duty, and this I must continue to remind myself, is to observe. I'm sure Emery wouldn't encourage such a move. Perhaps that's another reason why the corporation actively discourages pairings nowadays. A like-minded individual might have been able to convince me that it was a good idea to explore the island— that the secrets kept by the corporation were worth knowing. I don't know about that, but there are two sides to this coin. If that bridge of ice is traversable, then it is traversable in both directions. Emery has finished his lunch. Nothing remains of that plate of chicken chunks. I'd better get back to my sandwich. Too distracted. Seems I'm getting the hang of this diary business. Later. And so it begins. I want to put it down to my imagination. In fact, I'm certain it was just my imagination. For Emery remained asleep as I stood at the north window, gazing towards the island. But there were lights over there. Shapes that danced above the topmost crags. All colours. Greens and blues were followed by reds and yellows, rising and falling above the peaks, like the souls of buried jesters, juggled by invisible hands of air. And there were shadows, swirling forms that seemed to emerge from the very rock, like sea smoke rising from warm water, descending the precipitous cliffs in quest of the frozen waters below. I pinched myself. Not a dream— a majestic fantasy, but quite ghastly in its frenetic garishness. I watched for no more than ten minutes, before the illusion faded, and reluctantly I committed the details of my sighting to the watchman's logbook. I was plain with my words. Matter of fact, 
compared the dancing shapes to the northern lights, the sneaking shadows to a trick of the light. And I left out my feelings, the powerful sense of dread that the appearance of those strange things stirred in me. I've never experienced gloom before, nothing like melancholy. But the onset of that weird spectacle brought about an overwhelming bleakness that held me in its terrible grip, a trance-like state that promised only sorrow and doom. I'm in bed now, the bedroom being situated on level two, the lantern at my side flickering wanly, hopelessly dull, compared with those things that danced above the island. Emery will be in shortly. I eagerly await dawn, the inevitability of the sunrise that serves to remind one that all is well, that everything is as it should be, normal, ordinary. But, as I lie here in this cold bed, the faint whistle of the night wind, the only sound, I am plagued by the memory of those queer shadows seeking the white pathway, smoky tendrils reaching, probing. What were they looking for? April 22 It's early, and I've still duties to perform this morning, but this couldn't wait. I was on my way to procure firewood for the stove, when I was nudged by Emery. It seemed that my feline companion, yet again, was trying to get my attention, and, furthermore, seemed intent on guiding me to the main door on the ground floor. Down we went, and once there— I unlocked it and pulled it open. The chill air that rushed in to greet me was biting. It's very difficult to describe just how cold it is up here. I've experienced my fair share of extreme weather during several winters in the Tiger, but this place is something else. Cold with purpose is one way of putting it, a cold that has something to say, something of great importance. But there was a uh, something else out there waiting for me this morning. Emery emitted that low yowl of his, only the second time he'd done so. A series of footprints were visible in the compacted snow, leading right up to the door. Not my steps from the day before. These were narrow prints, made by slender booted feet. Donning my furs, I stepped outside, ignoring the cat's hiss of disapproval. I followed the steps all the way to the ice bridge, by way of which this mysterious slender-footed stranger had undoubtedly come. But that's where I stopped. I hadn't the energy or the will to attempt to go any further. So, what's going on here? Is the island inhabited by an elusive, slender-footed race? Or were the curious footprints made by an arctic, bipedal beast of some description? I scratched my head as I returned to the shelter of the lighthouse, pausing on the threshold, as the realization that the prince of the nocturnal wanderer had come in only one direction disturbed my train of thought. I've just now completed a thorough search of the lighthouse on the lookout for wispy interlopers. Emery's demeanor suggests that we're alone, but the fact that, prior to the discovery of the prince, the cat was aware of the presence of something outside vexes me as I write. Time to fetch some wood. Stoke the fire. A cup of coffee might settle my nerves. What do you think, Emery? Later. I'm puzzled, and no closer to an answer concerning who or what came to the door this morning. But Emery's disposition now tells me that something is amiss. He wouldn't touch the food I put out for him. And whenever I approach the north window, he yowls frantically. I've taken to talking to him now, like a true colleague, hopeful that in so doing, I'll work out a means by which to construe his behavior. When he's close to me, he settles somewhat, purring gently. But when, for example, he marches off on one of his lone inspections, his tail trails along the ground, and his ears are lowered. I have to admit, though, that I'd be twice as afraid without him. Yes, I know he's just a cat, but his instincts are sharper than mine, sharper than any man's, I'd venture. 
here on the edge of the world, with only one's thoughts for company, you'd forgive a lone watchman for losing his marbles. But with a cat like Emery by one side, one might just be able to hold on to them. For a little while longer, anyway. I'm not looking forward to nightfall. Later. It's late, 11.36pm, according to my watch. No lights tonight, no creeping shadows. But there's a racket. Several strange noises, all of which, it would seem, are carried by the northerly wind to the quay, where, uncannily, they're able to penetrate the thick glass windows and stone walls in order to reach my ears. My feline companion is haunted by these sounds, on his haunches most of the time, yowling ceaselessly, and these sounds are unlike any I've ever heard before. There are bouts of dissonant melodies like the insane piping of church organs, uncanny cackles belonging to throats less than human and much less than animal, horribly suggestive clashes comparable to vast portions of glacial ice tumbling into the sea. Again, reluctantly, wanting desperately to attribute these things to my imagination, I'll make a note of the sounds in the watchman's logbook. Make a note with a pencil gripped by a trembling hand. And again, I'll omit to mention the gloom, the dread I feel. Those predecessors of mine who went mad, those who disappeared entirely, were they too haunted by the Isle of Leir? It would seem that that dark rock has it in for us, all of us. It sure as heck doesn't want me to get any sleep tonight. I suppose I'll just lie in bed, staring at the ceiling, glancing at the flickering lamp beside me, wrestling with Emery at my feet, wondering what it's all about, why the corporation is so secretive about it, until that infernal commotion ceases. Will it cease? Give me a break. April 23. No sun today, just grey, gloomy skies. The night was long. Emery and I were in and out of sleep, but the sounds eventually stopped just after 3 a.m., which at least put an end to our fretting. The routine continues. The fire is fed, Emery is fed. No appetite myself. Seen to the light, which now I think about it, seems little more than an invitation to the inhabitants of the island, who or whatever they might be. A bright yellow eye that shines interminably, illuminating my small world day and night. I braved the main door again this morning, and I'm pleased to report that there were no new footprints waiting for me outside. So it's back to the watch, the endless watch. I'm by the north window as I write, throwing glances at the island, its sharp pinnacles resembling a silver crown, implying the existence of a giant beneath the frozen waters, a goliath of the deep, waiting, patiently waiting, for the right moment to rise from the depths, to show its ghastly face to the world once more. My imagination is getting the better of me again. <laughs> what do you think, Emery? Have I got it in me to sit this thing out? I'm losing myself here. A little walk wouldn't kill me. A stroll over to the island, to prove to myself that there's nothing out of the ordinary over there, nothing that's out to get me, nothing dangerous. It's like the corporation said, just as the advertisement for the position stated. Perform routine maintenance tasks to ensure the proper functioning of the lighthouse. Monitor and record observations of noteworthy events on the adjacent island. Keep detailed logs of weather conditions, etc. Noteworthy events, not strange or unusual events. It's quiet out there at the moment. The weather's been much the same since the blizzard of April 18. I'm going to go, in spite of your protests, Emery. Wish me luck. Later. I'm back, and in one piece. 
and I found something. I'll start at the beginning. I left the lighthouse at noon, and under the grey ceiling found myself traversing the bridge of ice, some fifty feet wide now. The cautious trudge took roughly an hour, guided by the looming island ahead of me. I swear, that place is much larger than it appears from the quay, sheer and oppressive, towering above you like a colossal fortress, impenetrable. The silence of the place dominates all. It's intimidating. Constantly I found myself looking over my shoulder, to the left and to the right, sensing eyes on me with every step. Reaching the island proper, I clambered up to the cliff face, and saw that there were numerous cave mouths, one of which I discovered was large enough for me to crawl into. I hesitated only a moment before plunging headlong into that dark passageway, withdrawing my torch as I did so. I inched forward some thirty feet or so, before coming across the things which I thereby retrieved. A wool coat, heavily tarnished, and the water-stained remains of a journal, the name Bramley, just about legible on the front cover. If there was a body back there somewhere, I was reluctant to look for it, for what I read on the few pages that remained intact persuaded me to leave immediately. As I said, I made it back unharmed, and with both the coat and journal in my possession. Rather than quote from it, I'll attach the untarnished pages to this journal, and add notes as appropriate. Bramley's Journal The first of the three pages is partially water-stained, and so the legible portion of the page begins mid-sentence. Any other time of year, the climb would have been impossible, but I managed it just about. I reached a ledge, and saw a narrow fissure in the rock that seemed to provide a safer route to higher ground. I took this route, and found that I was climbing at a much gentler gradient, all the while moving further and further towards the centre of the island. I must have climbed for several hours in this fashion, thankful that I brought a handful of snacks along with me for the journey. Not enough, mind, but better than nothing at all. I must be out of my mind, I thought, as I clambered up that sloping fracture. But that driving force, powerful and unrelenting, compelled me to continue. I mustn't turn back, I said over and... Further water damage at the bottom of the page renders the remainder of that paragraph illegible. The second of the three pages, however, is completely intact. It was as though I'd found myself standing in a vast courtyard, hemmed in by unearthly church steeples. Deep violet skies hung overhead. The silence was palpable. This was a spiritual place, I thought, and assuredly the very top and centre of the strange isle. In the middle of the space, a good three hundred feet from my position at the top of the stairs, stood a small structure, clearly man-made, resembling a mausoleum. I went towards the structure, all the while paying close attention to my surroundings, desolate and quiet as they were. I had the feeling that the towering spires were manned by watchmen, their purpose not dissimilar to mine, but, unlike me, these men hadn't abandoned their posts, and would soon raise the alarm, alerting the dwellers of this place to my presence. But no sounds followed, no cries, no horns, just the dead silence that had haunted me from the very moment I set foot on the island. The third and final page is water-stained towards the end, but I think enough can be gleaned from it regardless. When at last I reached the small structure, I saw that it could be nothing else but a mausoleum. The word Lair, being the name of the island, was etched in bold lettering above a huge stone door, on either side of which broad columns supported a surprisingly plain hip roof. And then, as the last vestiges of light faded above, the stone door swung open inexplicably, 
and from the darkness beyond rushed a ghastly stench, filling my nostrils and forcing me backwards. A maniacal cackle sounded from that hitherto silent structure, the very same sibilant shrieking I'd heard night after night at the lighthouse, the cries of the king, awakened once more to drink of the human body. My nightmares come to life, I turned and fled, saw the watchman, my predecessors, descending from the spires like deflated, desiccated. End of journal. What can be made of this? It's eerie, but it makes for fascinating reading. Could there really be a mausoleum at the centre of the island? If so, who or what is the thing that lies within, ostensibly quite alive? I wish I could say that Bramley's account was nothing more than the result of a fever dream. But I, too, have heard things, seen things. Emery is wise to it, too. How the remains of my predecessor came to be in the darkness of that cave, I am unable to surmise. But I don't like it. Don't like it one bit. The corporation must know about it. They've known about it from the very first. But still I'm baffled. Observations are one thing. But what if this thing comes after me? I've no means to sound the alarm, no means of escape. What are we to do, Emery? The cat has nothing to say on the matter. But he's very vocal about Brumley's coat. Can't blame him, really. It stinks. April 24 Another strangely silent night. Like a night in the void. Slept better, though. Emery seems all right, since throwing that coat out, that is. Watched me do it, too. We could do without the smell of death in here. In spite of all I've experienced, the routine continues. Feed the fire, feed Emery, feed myself, survey the light. Nothing out of the ordinary today. Glum. Later. Emery knew it was going to happen, before it happened. He approached me, yowled quietly. He was afraid. Didn't need to learn cat speak to sense that. And then I heard it. Three solid raps at the door downstairs. Like the waters outside, I froze, eye to eye with a trembling emery. A space of several seconds passed, and then the raps sounded again. Three distinct knocks. My head whirled. A thousand thoughts flashed through my mind. Had a slender-footed being come once again to my door? I went to the north window, tried to get a glimpse of who or what might be out there. But it was dark outside, not helped by the overhanging balcony above that threw the lower portions of the lighthouse into shadow. The rap sounded again. Bracing myself for the cold, I climbed the ladder that leads to the balcony and pushed open the hatch. Without my furs, the cold was almost unbearable, numbing my extremities, poking at my eyes. But I meant to be outside only briefly. I made my way to the railing, and peered over the edge into the gloom below. I thought I caught sight of a shape in the darkness, but I couldn't be sure. Back through the hatch I went, and down into the watch-room. Emery was yowling again, and rushed over to me the moment he saw me. The raps came again, and I was left with a simple choice. Ignore the mysterious caller, or answer the summons. And yet I managed to conjure up a third option, and made my hesitant way downstairs, intending to listen by the door, to somehow determine the nature of the call, without opening it. With all the stealth I could muster, I crept towards the door, and placed my ear up against it. It's a large, metal door, and weatherproof, designed to withstand the most brutal of blizzards. So I was fairly confident in its ability to offer protection from whatever lurked without. But with that heavy object between me and the outside world, little could be heard, other than the faint and familiar whistle 
of the arctic wind. Suddenly, the rap sounded again, frightening me half to death. Hello? I called without thought, my heart in my mouth. And dimly, very dimly, I heard an answering voice. Let me in, the voice called, an empty voice. Who are you? I'm cold. Who are you? I repeated. It's cold out here. Answer the question. Cold without my coat. I froze at that. Brumley. Brumley was out there. But that simply couldn't be. If the spectre of the dead watchman was out there and he wanted his coat, he'd have to go searching for it on the ice. Who are you? I called again, nervously. But no further responses followed. I retreated, terrified. Emery was waiting for me in the watchroom, yowling like a cat possessed. I comforted him the best I could, shivering from head to toe. The ghosts of the island were closing in, emboldened somehow. Could a door, a simple metal door of the material world, really prevent their intrusion? Nothing has happened since, but I think my feline companion and I are at the end of our tethers. I'm not sure how much more we're able to take. April 29 Days have passed without incident. The routine has continued. I've risen at dawn, kept the fire burning. Emery and I are well fed. The light continues to shine. I've been over these journal entries and the watchman's logbook a dozen times, wondering if it wasn't just a dream, barring the salvaged papers of Brumley, that is. Emery seems his usual pleasant self, happy to just eat and lounge about, as is a cat's prerogative. But I'm not so settled. There's an atmosphere of expectation— like hidden forces are mounting against us, gathering the will and means necessary to take the lighthouse and its occupants. If so, this could be the end for me and my feline companion. If, after all, I'm not imagining all of this. Imagination is a powerful thing, especially when it's all a man has left, isolated in a barren place, trapped by the elements, stuck in repetition." but I'm quite sane. I know this only too well. I'd welcome madness at this stage, I think. Madness, at least, is served with a chance of recovery. If only the promise of adequate compensation was enough to get me through. How am I to endure another eight weeks? Later. The end is near. They're coming. I'm by the north window, Emery at my feet, quivering. Under the light of the aurora, the king approaches. He's a mass of color, sometimes liquid, at other times solid, taking the form of a giant, like the Yatnar of the Norse. His shrieks penetrate this humble lighthouse, ghastly proclamations of intent. Behind the king trail the slender-footed shadows of men looking to my squinting eyes like emaciated corpses. Bromley is among them. I can just about make out his distinctive wool coat. Must have found it, after all. It's a nightmare procession, a fleet of ghouls commanded by a spectral monarch. They advance so slowly. Why do you tease me, my king? Be merciful and plunge thy blade deep into my breast. And yet still, the ethereal army creeps and crawls, slender feet trample the ice, their shimmering leader conducts them like the shriveled members of a dead orchestra. The king's music is dissonant and terrible, not meant for the ears of men. Surely it was composed for hell's welcome ceremony. The watch is over. No longer can I gaze on a spectacle such as this. My head hurts. My limbs ache. Must find a way to keep them out. Thoughts on paper won't save me. Nor you, Emery. But wait. 
There's a rapping at the door. It's coming in threes, just as it did before. Tis a sound I just cannot ignore. What will I do about these things at my door? Later. They're inside. I've barricaded the door to the watchroom. Emery and I are cowering by the stove. I thought about setting fire to the fuel in the store, but I can't get to it now. The king and his followers have brought their maddening music to the lighthouse, and mean to take the cat and me, by any means possible, back to the island, to that courtyard at its centre, overlooked by the lofty cathedral spires, into the blackness of his unholy mausoleum, to what ultimate end I dread to think. They're at the door now, dozens of lumbering forms, hammering with withered fists, the serpentine shadow of the king at their backs, urging them on. I hear the splintering of wood. The cat is at his wit's end. It's over. What can be done against such things? This mysterious king and his acolytes of darkness. What else is there to say? I'm sorry, Emery. If somebody finds this journal, I beg of you, demolish the lighthouse, abandon the watch. We don't belong here. Don't come looking for me, for my feline companion and I are bound for the island, to be drained by the king, desiccated, turned to prunes. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.